team is uh, needs to be promoted to. Ah, uh, yes, as yes, well. he was he wasn't on our our magic list here. Now he's in. Awesome, thank you. Great, thanks. All right. Well, with that, I'm calling this hearing of the Boston City Council Ways and Means Committee to order. For the record, my name is Kenzie Bach. I'm the District 8 City Councilor and also the Chair of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, and this hearing is being recorded. It's being live streamed at boston.gov slash city-council-tv. And it's also broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. Um, today's hearing is part of the Boston City Council's review process for the proposed FY22 budget which encompasses about 35 hearings and working sessions. Um, and it's really, you know, a 360 degree look at how the city is planning to spend our money in the upcoming year. Uh, and uh, about five of those have been working sessions, which are counselors only, but most of them are hearings like this with departments. And we welcome the public to come and testify at those. So if you're watching this and you're interested in testifying, um, you can either you can go to boston.gov slash budget dash testify to see all the ways. You can go to boston.gov slash council dash budget in order to see the full calendar. Um, you can shoot us an email at the committee at ccc.wm, it's for ways and means, so ccc.wm at boston.gov. Um, so we can take written testimony there or your request to testify in person at the Zoom. That website, boston.gov slash budget dash testify has got the way to upload a video of yourself that we can append to one of these hearings. Um, and we're also having two dedicated public testimony hearings left. So if you wanna come and speak in the evening and not have to wait for presentations, May 25th at 6 p.m., we're having one focused on the Boston Public Schools budget, and June 3rd at 6 p.m., we're having one focused on any other aspect of the budget. Um, so please do come sign up on the online forum and join us for those. Uh, and you can also tweet informally your questions at BOS budget, that's hashtag BOS budget. Today's hearing is on docket 0524 to 0526, orders for the FY22 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and for other post-employment benefits. Docket 0527 to 0528, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket 0529 to 0531, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. And docket 0546, an order authorizing an appropriation from the Boston Equity Fund. Um, so those are the whole budget dockets, but our, our focus today really is the Office of Economic Development, the Equity Fund, and the Office of Women's Advancement. Um, so we're grateful uh, to all of them for joining us. And um, we will uh, we'll be hearing today from um, Midori Morikawa, our Chief of Economic Development, Natalia Artube, Director of Small Business, um, and the Executive Director of Imagine Boston 2030, uh, Chief Bar Selena Barrios Milner um, of the Equity Cabinet, um, Ale Alexandra Valdez, the Executive Director of the Office of Women's Advancement, um, and also Ali Puello um, and Danny Green. Um, so I'm joined here by my colleagues, Councillor Liz Braden of District 9, Councillor Anissa Sabi george at large, Councillor uh, Ed Flynn of District 2, Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, Councillor Michelle Wu at large, and Councillor Julia Mejia at large. So thank you to the colleagues for being here. Um, and uh, without further ado, um, we'll jump right in. So I will pass it over to Chief Midori Morikawa to start us off. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, Chairwoman Bach, uh, Vice Chairwoman Sabi george Councillor Flynn, Councillor Breeden, Councillor Flaherty, Councillor Wu, and Councillor Mejia. Again, my name is Midori Morikawa, and I'm the Chief of Economic Development for the City of Boston. I'm also joined today by Selena Barrios Milner, Chief of Equity Inclusion, and Natalia Otebe, Director of Small Business. You will hear from them about the city's equitable procurement efforts as well as a work in the small business. Next slide. So just a quick overview of our Office of Economic Development Cabinet. Um, so as many of you know, our cabinet was created back in 2014 to promote equitable economic development, to ensure that there is a shared prosperity for both the residents and businesses by removing barriers to business growth, unlocking innovation in areas that create jobs, advancing a sustainable growth-based strategy, emphasizing the following five strategies, neighborhood development without displacement, neighborhood and stakeholder engagement, comprehensive community planning, promotion of Boston as the destination for business and visitors, and regional and international partnerships. Next slide. So our number one priority um, is to uh, develop pathways to overcome income and wealth disparities and disproportionate opportunities. Chief Barrios Miller will go over in more detail about some of our key accomplishments this year, as well as some of the goals for FY22. Uh, Next slide. 
Our priority number two uh, is our business development and job growth. Um, so as many of you know, uh, the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact, especially for our small business constituents. Uh, so uh, Director Natalia will talk uh, more about what sports and resources that we were able to assist uh, many thousands of businesses uh, here in Boston. Uh, we also want, will be talking about our cannabis work uh, that is picking up uh, to ensure that any equity applicants uh, interested in going into the emerging industry uh, is able to do so with the support from our team. Um, and lastly, the summer jobs, uh, especially we work very closely with the Boston Private Industry uh, Council uh, to, to recruit uh, uh, private sector employers uh, to uh, place our young people into uh, the meaningful employment experience uh, during summer months. Uh, so that is one of our key strategies as well. Next slide. And prior number three is a placemaking and community economic development uh, to establish fair, transparent, and equitable policies and strategies for land use and development in targeted Boston neighborhoods. So we are doing some work uh, uh, in our Upham's Corner neighborhood. Uh, the economic development without displacement is our goal there. Uh, we are also working very closely with our Boston Planning and Development Agency uh, on some of the neighborhood uh, planning uh, process on that. Uh, Natalia will also talk a little bit in detail about the, the main streets, reimagining main streets. As you know, there are 20 main street districts in the city of Boston. Uh, so we are have been doing uh, some conversation, focus groups, and data ga gathering uh, to see how we can reimagine uh, our main street districts. Next slide. Just a quick overview on the, you know, the economic development uh, cabinet. Uh, these uh, these departments uh, within the cabinet uh, work together to shape our economic development policies in Boston. Uh, so we have the Boston uh, Planning Development Agency, Office of Workforce Development, Tourism, Sports and Entertainment, Consumer Affairs and Licensing, and the Boston Licensing Board. Next slide. So I will spend some time talking about FY21 highlights. Next slide, please. So first thing I wanted to highlight is our uh, equitable regulation ordinance in the cannabis industry. So as uh, you may recall, uh, back in 2019, our former Mayor Walsh, now Secretary Walsh, in partnership with Councilor Kim Janey, now our Mayor Janey, <laughs> and the Boston Council City signed an ordinance establishing equitable regulation of the cannabis industry in the city of Boston. So the ordinance seeks to repair the harms caused by the war on drugs, particularly to people Black, African-American, Hispanic, Latino, and Asian descent. The ordinance aims to ensure equity in Boston cannabis industry, pro providing funding and technical assistance to cannabis entrepreneurs from backgrounds and neighborhoods most impacted by the war on drugs. So what this ordinance allowed us to do is set up two uh, key strategies from our shop. One is equity fund, uh, and the other is technical assistance. Next slide. So just recently, uh, we've set out the cannabis uh, business technical assistance for equity applicants. Uh, so what it is, is that once equity uh, cannabis business is uh, deemed uh, equity applicant in the city of Boston, our office is able to provide uh, technical assistance. Uh, and you can see the services uh, at the uh, uh, bottom half page of this uh, slide. Uh, so it could be anything from uh, assistance with business operations, uh, coming out with business plan, uh, assistance recruiting employees, uh, guidance and uh, assistance through the application process in front of the, uh, the board, the cannabis uh, board, which is an independent uh, uh, board, assistance with legal compliance, tax, uh, security, you know, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, issues that, that is a, a focus on this industry uh, and anything else that they might need uh, in order to uh, be able to compete uh, to get licensed. Uh, from the cannabis board. Uh, so we're happy to report that uh, the cannabis business manager uh, was hired at the end of April. We have released an RFP, uh, which is a $675,000 investment over the next three years. Uh, it's really designed to help equity applicants be successful uh, in uh, setting up their cannabis business uh, in the city of Boston. Next slide, please. So the other thing that I mentioned, uh, the ordinance uh, was uh, helped us establish is the Boston Cannabis Equity Fund. So in addition to the technical assistance fund, uh, the uh, equity applicants can also access grants anywhere from $1,000 to $15,000 to new and existing uh, for a wide range of purposes, including working capital, startup costs, build out equipment purchases, uh, and rent. Um, so uh, just to give you a quick 
idea of where we are on the equity applicants. To date, 17 certified equity applicants have been heard before the Boston Cannabis Board. Uh, they have granted a host community agreements to 15 certified equity applicants. Uh, and we have uh, deferred two certified equity applicants for technical assistance. Uh, we have four currently in the various stages of the application process awaiting a hearing date. And there are currently at least nine applicants seeking equity status who have not completed the certification process. So we're very excited uh, that we are already getting some traction uh, from equity uh, applicants uh, who are interested in uh, getting being part of this emerging industry in the city of Boston. Next slide. The other accomplishment that I wanted to highlight uh, for FY21 uh, is our all-inclusive Boston campaign. And I hope, uh, counselors, you have seen this, um, the campaign in the bus stop, on the train, um, on the radio. Um, and so what it is, is um, it is a tourism uh, campaign. Uh, and as you can see on the slide, uh, the, our tourism industry has had some uh, devastating effect uh, from the pandemic. Uh, we lost about 70% of our forecasted visitors last year due to COVID. Uh, we, uh, pre-COVID, roughly 10% of jobs in Greater Boston came from the tourism sector, uh, while also contributing to supporting our cultural and historic pre preservation. And we are, uh, so this tourism campaign, uh, our effort is to build that sector back up stronger, more equitably, uh, to ensure that Boston future uh, and the economic development uh, is done in an equitable uh, fashion. Um, you know, so when we, you know, last year when, at the start of the pandemic, uh, you know, we have always uh, made decisions that protect our public health while recognizing the economic impact of this public health emergency. Uh, so we looked at, you know, sort of the impact in various industries. And while Boston stays strong, still on the fire sectors, right, the finance, insurance, real estate sector, uh, what really holds our economy uh, together and what makes our economy unique and makes us uh, give us a competitive advantage is all of these uh, workers uh, and sectors uh, that employ our black, brown, uh, Asian uh, immigrant uh, communities in the tourism, in the small business, the restaurant, the arts and culture industry, right? So the tourism is really uh, what makes uh, us, us unique. And, and frankly, this is, one of the reasons why businesses and companies want to come relocate in Boston, whether to set up their headquarters here or expand their business here, uh, is because of this quality of life and amenities uh, that the city offers. So we wanted to invest in this campaign uh, to make sure uh, that we can bring them back uh, equitably. Um, so next slide, please. So just to give you a quickly on the timeline, uh, of this campaign. Uh, so last fall, September 2020, is when we uh, publicly announced the RFP uh, to solicit uh, who can work with us uh, on this campaign. Um, and then uh, April of this year, uh, Mayor Janey uh, launched the All-Inclusive Boston officially uh, in a press conference uh, after media roundtable presentation uh, that morning. So this was, uh, you know, uh, worked with the our tourism uh, and sports entertainment uh, department. Uh, and this project really spanned to mayors, both playing an integral role in bringing back uh, the tourism industry that have uh, different uh, sectors and industries and businesses within that. Next slide, please. So when we released our RFP, uh, we uh, got a number of uh, quality proposals, but the one that clearly stood out uh, was a partnership led by Colette Phyllis Communication which is the Boston's oldest minority-owned and operated marketing, marketing communication firm, Proverb Marketing, and the Greater Boston Convention Visitors Bureau. So together, these three firms uh, worked uh, to develop the tourism campaign uh, with us. And it was also important for us to note that you know, we adhere to the city's commitment to equitable procurement in awarding city contracts. So thanks to the Federal CARES Act funding with this $2.5 million investment in this tourism campaign, we are proud to say that this contract represented one of the largest MWBE contracts ever awarded by the city of Boston. Uh, and thank you, uh, thanks to a partnership with the uh, uh, office uh, with Selena. Uh, the goals of the campaign is really uh, threefold. We wanna draw a more diverse audience uh, of visitors. We wanna drive economic growth, Boston's uh, most ethnically diverse neighborhoods and communities, right? So we have a lot more to offer than just downtown, right? Just get out to our neighborhoods. Uh, we wanna encourage and promote that. 
You want to spotlight cultural and commercial assets in the area of Boston that have long been uh, marginalized. And I, I'm really happy to say that our partners, the Colette Phyllis Proverb uh, and the Greater Boston Commission Visitors Bureau also shared our values on uh, equitable procurement. So when we provide them with the $2.5 million investment, they've also uh, uh, engaged several MWB subcontractors. Uh, I'm going to name a few of them, uh, Black Girl Digital, Include, Library Wire Collaborative, Kelly Chan and Associates, just to name a few. Um, so, you know, not only did they love um, the working with us, but they also shared uh, a value uh, in ensuring an inclusive campaign to drive our equitable economic recovery uh, for the city of Boston. Next slide, please. So the current phase uh, is we, you know, as, as we move closer to the reopening date uh, of May 29th, uh, these uh, three goals, uh, safely welcome visitors, particularly local and regional visitors, invest in tourism promotion, showcase all that Boston has to offer. Um, uh, these are uh, the goals that we have on top of our mind, and I hope you love this campaign uh, as much as uh, we do. Next slide. Um, so I know there's some questions about sort of the, um, you know, how we are doing on this campaign. So since our, we launched on April 5th, we've seen 1.2 million social media impressions and about 500,000 500, views on launch video. These stats only tell part of the story, but are very promising. We also need to look at some of long-term ways to measure the impact of the campaign. So next slide, please. So the team came out with the big picture, key performance indicators, the KPIs. Um, so uh, to the first one is digital ads performance. Uh, so this is to analyze how digital ads perform. Uh, and this is in partnership with the Greater Boston uh, Convention Visitors Bureau. They're using arrival list pixel, which helps track consumers that interact with the ads and see if they continue to research planning a trip to Boston and hopefully book a trip here. The second thing is the perception of Boston. So as part of the RFP, we did a market research study to get perceptions of Boston. Now that the campaign is out there, we will want to compare the post-campaign numbers and the pre-campaign numbers to see if Boston is now perceived as a more welcoming place to visit. We're aiming to do this uh, follow-up study in the fall. So these are some of just uh, key highlights. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more going on, uh, but we just wanted to uh, make sure they highlight some of these uh, accomplishments, uh, thanks to the team uh, and the cabinet at the Office of Economic Development. So now I think I'm gonna turn it over to the next slide. Uh, Director Natalia uh, to go over some of the accomplishments for small business. Thank you so much, uh, Midori, and hello, everybody. Thank you for having us. Just want to quickly go over some of the um, things that we've done during COVID to support small businesses. Um, this is a laundry list of all of the different efforts um, that we've put forward from communications to policy updates. Um, so just very quickly, uh, we have weekly multi-departmental conference calls every Tuesday at three o'clock, uh, small business owners. Um, we put out weekly newsletters with uh, different resources that are available. We also host, um, and we're the first to host uh, virtual office hours um, every Friday, two different uh, block sets. Um, we also have hosted uh, dozens of public health guidance and reopening webinars, um, as well as uh, conducted surveys over the course of the last year. As far as policy updates, um, we put out financial relief handbook and uh, federal assistance guidelines to help businesses navigate um, the resources that were available at different levels um, of government. Um, we put together an unemployment insurance guide, um, as well as retail extensions onto public sidewalks, as well as fitness in public parks. Um, we also did a couple other things that I didn't mention here, including, um, you know, go to the state around um, including commercial uh, businesses in, in the in the moratorium, um, as well as uh, advocate on behalf of businesses um, with the third party um, um, apps for uh, takeout and delivery. Um, as far as business visibility, we've created a series of lists um, online where businesses can add themselves to get additional um, support from other businesses or from the public. Um, and specifically for restaurant support, as restaurants are uh, the one of the most highly impacted uh, industries, um, we worked really hard to get takeout um, to be allowed for all businesses, beer and wine takeout and delivery, which I know you all know a lot about, allowing the sale of grocery items from restaurants, allowing um, 
And again, th this is where the legislation for third party caps for delivery apps and um, out updated outdoor dining efforts. Um, I'm going to go over all of the relief funds just because I know that there was a lot of questions about demographics, but I just want to give you an overview um, uh, about where we are. Next slide. Um, COVID-19 rapid response, um, this is just a little bit more details on those policy updates and support, um, which I just mentioned, um, uh, not included in the previous slide, food trucks, uh, neighborhood pilots, um, as well as uh, uh, the, the extensions of, um, sorry, I lo totally lost my train of thought, um, but all of this is included in the previous slide. This is just a kind of recap of that. Next slide. Um, here's a breakdown of the list that I mentioned that are really um, designed to help businesses through visibility, um, as well as reopening uh, resources that have been available for businesses over the course of the last uh, six to eight months, which um, are really those reopening uh, workshops, um, these temporary policies, uh, business posters, as well as the Reopen Boston Fund. Next slide. So very quickly, the Small Business Relief Fund was with, this was the first uh, fund that we opened um, last April. Um, today, we've uh, issued $6.7 million to 1,800 businesses. Of those, 51% um, were minority-owned businesses, 48% were immigrant, refugees, or naturalized citizens, and 70% um, were less than five employees. We designed this um, fund to be really reflective of the very small businesses that we knew exist in our our city. As you can see on the right, the types of businesses, um, the majority of those that benefited were personal service business, businesses like hair salons, nail salons, barbershops, as well as food businesses um, like restaurants and other takeout and catering businesses. Next slide. So here is um, the breakdown of, of those numbers. Um, I do want to just quickly note that um, uh, there, you know, the way in which we broke down these numbers were reflective of how the city has been collecting racial and demographic data. Um, we also wanted to make sure to include the business size and how many people were funded through through those um, th those breakdowns, and then the applicants by neighborhood. Um, it's not surprising that um, you'll see spikes in certain neighborhoods that tend to have larger concentrations of businesses, and we wanted to make sure that we were supporting businesses across the city. Next slide. The Reopen Boston Fund is the only fund that is currently open. Um, to date, we've issued $3.7 million to over 2,000 businesses. 60% um, of these businesses are minority owned, 62% are immigrant, refugee, or naturalized citizens, and 52% are uh, women owned. And if you go to the next slide, I can break down the neighborhoods of both recipients and applicants. I know that that was a big question about you know, why some people got them. Um, there was a lot, and I'll just quickly talk about um, why you have more, uh, obviously, a lot of applicants and some that didn't receive the funds. A lot of them um, weren't in the right business industry when they applied when we uh, first launched this fund. A lot of duplicates and a lot of people um, who were outside of Boston actually applied to this, this fund. Next slide. Um, these are the, this is the data on the Reopen Boston Fund. You can see we did this by phases at the very beginning when we launched this fund. It was really intended to support people as they were reopening. Um, at, at, to date, we are just using the expanded fund. Um, so that's why you see um, such a large number of applicants there once um, we got to that phase two and then phase three. Um, but as you can see, the total applicants were over 3,000, and we have funded um, uh, just over 2,000. Um, the request has been over 5 million, and we have funded 3.7 million. There are still funding, um, funding is still happening, so uh, these numbers will continue to evolve. Just some um, high level de uh, demographics that were on the previous slide, just the further breakdown of those racial demographics you can see here. Next slide. The Commercial Rent Relief Fund um, has issued $3.7 million um, to 353 businesses. Um, these uh, businesses are 60% minority owned, 57% immigrant, refugee, or naturalized citizen, and 44% women owned. And this is the breakdown by neighborhood. You can see um, to the right. Um, next slide. 
And as you look at, the, again, this is the further breakdown of race and ethnicity, gender and immigration status, and also the breakdown of the business types. So as you can see here, again, um, some of the highest supported industries have been food businesses and personal services um, and non-bar uh, food businesses. So as you can imagine, catering uh, companies have been devastated by the pandemic with the lack of events and, and gathering of spaces. So we really wanted to make sure that we were targeting all of our funding to be um, going towards the industries that were the hardest hit. Next slide. A couple things about the Commercial Rent Relief Fund. Um, uh, this fund was designed specifically to help prevent commercial displacement and vacancies in our local neighborhoods. The way we set this up was really to set goals about building relationships with landlords. Um, I actually have uh, been in front of this council several times talking about commercial vacancies, but also talking about relationships and data. Um, so this was actually the first time that we were able to um, actively gather some data around landlords and leases, which I think will be really important. But some of the goals that we set up were to build relationships with landlords, prevent displacement, and stabilize neighborhood commercial districts. Some highlights of this program that I think are unique and, um, you know, uh, really great in the long-term um, uh, effectiveness of this program is that the landlords are part of the application. So they have to agree to participate in order to qualify. Um, this ensures that, um, you know, the city can then put together a fund agreement between the city, the business and the landlord. So it's a three part contract that essentially um, says that the landlord is willing to work with the business in uh, to prevent displacement so that they will not be evicting um, businesses for lack of paying rent. Um, and we use the leverage of, of the grant to, um, to really qualify that. Next slide. Um, the Restaurant Relief Fund was a, a, a great partnership, an effort between a, a nonprofit organization called High Road Kitchens, um, as well as Councilor Lydia Edwards, who helped us um, really get this fund off the ground. Um, this was uh, intended to be for dining, um, business, dining or table service restaurants with payroll and rent funding um, to increase wages. So really thinking about how do we help businesses um, become sustainable um, in the future and this this fund was very small. It was intentionally really small. We funded 38 businesses um, at over half a million dollars. Um, over 70% of them were minority owned, 30% um, women owned. Uh, we did have one veteran owned business in there, which was really great. Next slide. The Certified Business Fund, um, which uh, uh, Chief uh, Barrios Milner's uh, team really led, um, was uh, has issued 1.8 million to 136 businesses, um, and the racial and gender breakdown is on the right. Next slide. Um, and this is also uh, just the industry breakdown of that particular fund. So as you can tell, there's a lot of diversity there of industries, um, but again, really focused on food businesses, construction businesses, and then, you know, the other. Next slide. So to date, we've issued $16.6 .6 million to over 4,500 businesses. Um, these are grants, again, not loans. So businesses do not have to worry about paying it back. We do ask, obviously, businesses to provide documentation and receipts to indicate how they're using these funds. Um, and I'm hopeful that once we close out the auditing of all of those funds, I, I will have a um, more exciting uh, breakdown of how the funds were used. Um, but, we'll, but to date, what we've found is most most businesses are, are using those funds for rent um, and for payroll, which is really indicative of what we wanted them to be using them for. Next slide. So we also um, very recently launched the Food Access and Local Supply Initiative, which is really a way to partner with the Food Access uh, Cabinet, um, sorry, the Office of Food Access, um, to establish a way for uh, local nonprofits and community-based organizations to uh, directly get their supplies from um, small businesses in the city of Boston. So um, this is very early on. We're just um, executing the, the grants, um, so I will We'll have more information later, but this is a really great way to um, help lift up and bring some um, uh, sustainability to uh, businesses that participate. Next slide. 
All right. So most of you know, but I'm going to just quickly go over Boston Main Streets and then talk a little bit about the Reimagine Boston Main Streets initiative and tell you kind of where we are and where we're going. Um, so there are 20 Main Streets um, in the city of Boston. They receive, they each receive $75,000 uh, per year for the city of Boston. Um, and that money is come directly from our community development block grants and NDF, which is Neighborhood Development Fund funding. Of that 75K, 575 uh, is for administrative costs, so salary, rent, and utilities, um, and 17.5 is uh, for programming costs, so um, things like putting on events or helping to uh, beautify the spaces um, in their districts. Next slide. So Reimagine Boston Main Streets was launched in um, March of 2020 when we released the RFP. Um, in August, we um, selected uh, consultants, CJ Strategies and Strategy Matters, um, with a subconsultant ASG um, uh, to help us get this uh, project underway. In November, we did a public launch um, and uh, since January have been essentially running community meetings. Some of the key um, elements of this program are one, obviously, uh, to engage stakeholders, um, but the second is really around research and analysis. We want to understand what are some great case studies, um, how are other uh, municipalities or um, areas across the, across the city or sorry, across the nation, running their main streets. What are some ways and strategies where we can enhance our main streets? How do we plan for the future? Um, so I want to just be clear that this Reimagine Boston Main Streets is not about individual main streets across the city. It is really about how the city is investing in our neighborhoods through main streets, how the city's uh, program is really run. Um, so, so some of the um, elements of this is obviously um, stakeholder engagement, doing environmental scan, research ideas, insight, um, programming, and best practices, um, a SWOT analysis, goal setting, um, developing future scenarios, um, and development and developing an implementation plan. Um, so where we are right now is we have um, concluded the first stage of community engagement. Um, there are some um, missing pieces there, so we will be going back and doing more uh, community engagement. But the real next step is around this research engagement and SWOT analysis. And so our hope is that by the fall, we will have some great recommendations of how we can enhance the uh, uh, Boston's Main Street program and be able to implement them um, for next fiscal year. Next slide. I also want to just briefly talk about um, Be Local, which is uh, the city's uh, digital engagement tool to support small businesses and counselors. If I if I may be so bold and ask you all to take out your cell phones and download this app, if you have not yet done so, you can look it up in your um, in your app. Uh, app store on your phone and uh, download it and use it. Um, it's a really great uh, program. So if you go to the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So we know that federal funds um, have supported businesses directly through the many funds that I just mentioned um, and has supported residents directly through, you know, things like unemployment insurance. One thing that we haven't really been able to leverage and would love to leverage more is um, was this idea around how do residents support small businesses and how do we leverage um, these federal funds to support and um, enhance that experience. So we put out um, a scope of what we wanted to do digital engagement app that supports lo local businesses through local spending. And we actually found a partner, um, Kolu, who is a, a startup. Um, next slide. And what we did is we put together this app, um, which essentially creates rewards um, for uh, shopping locally. Um, there are five different types of rewards that someone can earn. Um, and to date, um, um, if you see the rewards on the left, local in Boston is every app, every business that's listed on the app is um, able to get that, um, that reward. Um, support women-owned businesses, support minority and immigrant-owned businesses, support Boston's Main Streets, and support Black-owned businesses. So this is a really intentional way that we wanted to uh, make sure businesses were getting that additional visibility. So the way it works, 
Um, these are not your typical reward offers. You get 20% off the bat just for shopping at any of the businesses that are listed on the app. And then you can get 10% additional stacked rewards for any of the, the rewards on the left. Um, and it's a really great way to intentionally support um, some of our most uh, uh, disproportionately impacted businesses. So let's say you spend $10 at a store. Um, they happen to be a woman-owned, Black-owned business in a Main Street. That's going to be an additional 40% off, or uh, sorry, 40% back. So you'll get that initial 20 plus the 40. So if you spend $10, you would earn 6 Boston points. Those six points are equal $6. So next time you go to that store or any other store on the app, you would actually get $6 off of your purchase. And so the, the whole intention behind this is the more that you shop locally, the more points you earn, the more discounts you get as the user. And those businesses get more foot traffic, they get more visibility, and all of those rewards that they offer are actually being supplemented, or I'm um, sorry, reimbursed by the city of Boston. So as a grant directly to that business. Next slide. Um, so these are participate. There are two ways that a business can participate. They can either be a participating business or a redeeming business. Participating means that they just um, they're listed as a place where people can earn points. Redeeming is a business that can um, not only uh, earn points but they will actually take those discounts. So it's very very low. Um, low lift for businesses to be participating. It's a little bit more to be a redeeming business because obviously we have to issue them payments. So there's a little bit more tracking that happens there, which is why you see less redeeming businesses than participating business. Um, we are um, actively trying to get all participating businesses to be redeeming businesses, but this is where we are today. We just launched this pilot um, April 17th. So we're just about a month in. Next slide. These are the industries that are listed on the app, which are, again, not surprising. Uh, professional services and, and restaurants, really intentional there. Um, wanted to make sure that we were supporting um, and lifting up the restaurants um, in our neighborhoods, as well as the other um, highly impacted uh, businesses. So as you can see here, um, restaurants, health and beauty, professional services, those are really uh, demonstrated here. Next slide. So the app is available to download. I recommend all of you download it. I'd appreciate it if you all sent it uh, to your newsletters, to your residents, to your uh, constituents. Um, it's a really great way of supporting businesses. Um, and it's a, it's a great way of getting rewarded as a shopper. Um, I also encourage you to let us know if any of your uh, favorite businesses are not listed and encourage them, the business, to sign up. Um, because sometimes hearing it from us doesn't have the same impact as hearing it from their customers. So um, that's been our pitch on there. And I think that's my last slide. And I think I'm turning it over to uh, Chief Barrios Miller. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us here today um, to share some of the work we've been able to do in the past fiscal year. If we could go to the next slide. I'm just going to highlight some of our key accomplishments in equity and inclusion. Um, as you know, we completed the disparity study, um, and the this was a two-year process. Um, and the key takeaway uh, from the study is um, that we were able to, the consultants were able to identify substantial underutilization of minority and women-owned businesses. So that now gives us the legal framework to apply um, contract-specific race and gender goals um, to our city contracts, which is a new tool um, that I'll be going further into. Can go to the next slide. Um, so we um, established an executive order um, that both accepts the results of the disparity study and immediately sets a annual spend goal for the city of Boston of 25%. Um, that for anyone that, that was reading the disparity study closely, they estimate that there is an availability of a total of 17% minority and women-owned businesses. And those were businesses that um, they could verify independently that our minority 
majority are women owned, so they aren't necessarily certified by us or the state yet. Um, and that perform the lines of work that the city buys. So they estimated there was a 17% availability. However, we did stretch that goal to 25% because um, the, the definition of, of, of available um, kind of reinforces some of the barriers that specifically minority owned and women businesses face. So for example, to, to be considered available, you had to have um, already bid on a city contract or shown interest in bidding on a city contract or have held a contract of this sort. And, and you know, so some of the, we actually think that um, just beneath that level, there's a lot more minority and women businesses that we could be doing business with. Um, so we did stretch our goal to 25% and immediately um, established a supplier diversity program that um, will now oversee um, this uh, overall goal for the city. But um, the way that we're going to get there is through applying goals to specific contracts based on the types of industries present in those contracts. Next slide. Um, this just recaps uh, what I just said. This is the goal of our new program. So we're overall, this program will oversee uh, this new contract goal setting complex uh, process and hold departments accountable. Um, it'll also help build the pipeline of available businesses because I know that we've heard from a lot of city departments that sometimes they can't find um, the, the specific type of business um, that's certified and in, in what they're procuring at that time. So uh, we are uh, going to be helping to, to find those businesses, build their capacity so they can be ready for city contracting. And overall, going to look at the, the procurement process and other areas in which we could reduce barriers and, and look at innovative strategies um, that can make it more accessible for uh, local, small, women-owned, and uh, minority-owned businesses. Um, with the, this new program, um, the city invested a total of $2 million in supplier diversity. Um, Please ignore that top line. That was a that was actually just the seventy three thousand um, was just for the in relation to the supplier diversity manager. It's my mistake, but I just want to outline the positions and where we are with hiring. So we've hired three new positions for supplier diversity, um, and we're in the process of hiring the next three. Um, I believe two of those three are posted um, and the third we are is in the um, request to post stage. Um, we've been engaging with um, with uh, businesses throughout the whole pandemic and before we were able to um, do in in person uh, information sessions and opportunity fairs in this fiscal year and then um, quickly pivoted to online offerings and so part of our what we would have norm normally spent on in-person events um, and printing materials and all of those things we we pivoted um, to invest in an online platform that allows us to have meaningful online engagement and we've used um, this remo platform and in some cases Zoom meetings or Zoom webinars, just so that we can still continue to see and connect people um, and have actually heard through that process that having an online option made it easier for, for some folks to participate um, who may not have been able to because of childcare issues. So I think it's, it's a tool, even as we reopen, we wanna consider keeping in our um, kit uh, because we did see that um, we were able to reach folks that may not have been able to you know, come into the city for one of these events in the past. Um, we also, um, for the first time, have moved into providing direct financial support through these new investments. So Natalia already touched on the Certified Business Fund, which was a pandemic response uh, fund connected to CARES Act money. But we are um, committing to providing direct support to minority and women businesses to build their capacity through the Contracting Opportunity Fund, which actually just closed. We're now reviewing applications. It just closed this Monday. Um, and we, we're hoping to award a total of 750000 And it's specifically for businesses who um, are interested in contracting with the city and want to build their capacity for that purpose. Um, so I think this is another great great way to, to kind of see the pipeline that's out there and continue to support them. 
And lastly, I'll just end because equity and inclusion isn't isn't all procurement. I know procurement has been uh, of of uh, interest, um, but all we also are working always on the Boston resident jobs policy. And um, I, we had um, in terms of um, FY21, um, we continue our transition to the Salesforce platform. We've now transitioned all of our data, and all new projects are going on to Salesforce. We've hired a new full-time Salesforce administrator, and we hired four new construction monitors. Two of those were to fill vacancies, and two are new positions um, that were created. So this is our largest monitoring team, and so we, we really are committed to, as we continue to reopen, recover, and construction continues to boom, uh, we want to make sure that our local residents, women and people of color, um, can participate in that prosperity. That's the end of my presentation. And then I think I would like to close uh, in discussing the FY22 plans and investment. Um, so as you heard from Director Natalia, uh, we are going to implement Reimagine Boston Main Street's recommendations. Uh, so we look forward to working with you uh, to uh, to make this happen. Uh, we are uh, in the process of launching Cannabis Equity Fund. Uh, so we are hoping that our equity applicants can take advantage uh, of the resources that we have. Um, as uh, many of you know, we have uh, received additional investment of $1 million for job training for hard-hearted industries. Uh, so we are working internally with our arts and culture, uh, with our office of workforce development, uh, with the environment department uh, to see how we want to potentially work together uh, to ensure uh, that we provide job training uh, for uh, people that were impacted by the pandemic. Uh, we will also build out supply diversity program to meet equitable procurement goals, as uh, mentioned by Selena. Uh, we will release final RFP for the Upham's Corner Arts Innovation District. Uh, and then we are also in conversation about business improvement district uh, formation uh, uh, for, the, for the next year. Uh, so that will be the conclusion of our uh, presentation. Great, thank you so much, Chief Morikawa. And um, I want to note that we were joined um, early on uh, in the presentation by uh, Councillor Andrea Campbell from District 4 and Councillor Lydia Edwards from District 1, so they're here as well. Um, we'll be jumping right into questions, and as usual, I'll, I'll defer mine to, um, actually, sorry, the, I, I guess the question is, um, we've got, because we have women's advancement here too. Uh, Alexandra, and you have a presentation as well, right? Can you give me a sense of how long that is? It's about two slides. I would say less than 10 minutes. Okay, great. Then then definitely let's have you go now so that counselors can ask the questions for everybody at once. So. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for letting us go next. Um, I'll try to to swap it up and give time, but um, thank you for having us and most of all um, for being choosing all the information about MOA. Uh, my name is Alexandra Valdez and I'm the new executive director of the Office of Women's Advancement. And I'm joined today by Ali Apulio, which she's our policy manager and will give a short presentation on our current child care entrepreneur fund program. And then I will go into more detail as our FY22 investments. So give me one second as I go ahead and share my screen for the presentation. Great, I will hand it over um, to Ali. She is gonna be the first to go over um, the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund, and then I will jump in with our FI22 um, budget. Good morning. Hi, I'm Ali Puglio. As Alex mentioned, I'm the Policy and Research Manager for the Mayor's Office of Women's Advancement. Um, and it's my pleasure to talk to you today about our Child Care Entrepreneur Fund. Um, the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund was launched in fiscal year 2020, um, that was a pilot year, 
um, and has since, as we'll talk about soon, expanded significantly. Um, to start, just want to give you a quick overview of what a family child care is. A family child care is a small in-home child care run by a provider in their own residence. So there's less than 10 children um, per EEC regulations. Um, and it's a small business run by someone who offers a child care service, again, out of their own house. Um, and they're usually located all over the city um, in all of our neighborhoods. And the people who provide care are part of those communities and they know the families that they serve in their own neighborhoods. So the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund um, is focused on serving these family child care providers because we learned that nearly 400 of these businesses closed between 2010 and 2019. Um, so there's a really a rapid um, decrease in the amount of supply available. Um, and these tend to be um, more affordable. Um, they have more flexible hours. Um, and they have, again, a good community connection to the folks they serve. Um, the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund is a competitive grant program. We offer $3,500 grants. Um, these are flexible funds that can be used for um, things like fencing in your backyard so that the EEC will allow the children to go out and play there. It can be used for purchasing high quality educational materials um, or for paying off bills that accrued during COVID closures. Um, the, we also offer a six workshop course to accompany the grant funds that is required to participate in the workshop program in order to receive the funds. Um, and these really focus on the fundamentals of being a small child care business owner. It's a really unique sector. Um, there's a really a small, a small pool of folks who are qualified to train um, related to these particular business processes. So we're lucky to have partners at United Way who are really experts in both the business side and the child care side. Um, the topics include leadership, budgeting, tax preparation. Um, since the pandemic, we've pivoted to offer these over Zoom. So um, we provide the workshops um, taught by United Way. It's a six week cohort or six workshop cohort. Um, and we provide simultaneous translation to anyone who needs it. Um, so in terms of equity, of course, this is an equity program kind of on two fronts, right? So we're, we're talking about um, the family child care providers themselves who are 90% women, 61% women of color, and 44% immigrant in the city of Boston, um, and are low income with average annual income of $27,000 and 33% of this sector uh, lives below the poverty line. So it's a, an equity program both for the providers themselves and of course the families who utilize childcare. Um, we know that childcare access is a barrier to women participating in the workforce. Um, and uh, so it serves our residents on, on two sides there. In terms of the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund program itself, um, we make the application available in 10 languages. Um, we do provide simultaneous translation, as I mentioned, for, for all the workshops. So we did offer, um, we offer appli applicants um, are eligible blind to their translation or interpretation needs. So the first cohort, we had Cantonese and Spanish simultaneous translation. Since then, um, we've had Spanish interpretation and we've since run our first Spanish speaker only cohort because we had enough accepted applicants um, who are Spanish speakers that we're able to access um, a United Way trainer who is a Spanish speaker and has this unique expertise. Um, and so she uh, is currently leading our first cohort full of Spanish speakers. So it's exciting times. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so in fiscal year 22, we are projecting five cohorts of the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund with 100 grantees. Um, that's about 20% of the family child care operators in the city of Boston. Um, we are regularly receiving um, about five times more applications than we can fund with each cohort. So there's, there's a high demand for this program. Um, and we're estimating that we'll do 93 grantees at $3,500 each, which is the level that we have been funding in the past and trying to expand the program to support childcare cooperatives and startups with a higher level of grant funding um, and more hands-on support. 
So we are expecting that we'll be able to um, support some of these more startup businesses um, with the addition of our new program manager, who we're hoping to hire next fiscal year, um, who will oversee this program um, and be able to provide that kind of attention and guidance um, that uh, the startup businesses will need. Um, as of June of 2020, uh, as I mentioned, there are 485 licensed family child cares in the city of Boston. Um, and so if we were able to train 100 uh, folks in one year, that'll be 20%. So uh, between the folks we've already trained and the folks that we expect to train in the next year, we will have trained 40% of family child cares in the city of Boston, which is really exciting. And uh, that we expect in fiscal year 22 to award $374,000 in grants. Um, we were able to um, significantly expand the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund in fiscal year 21 because of a uh, workforce development grant and some private funding um, that we received. So we're uh, happy that the proposed budget includes um, fundings to support that expansion. Um, which we see is desperately needed by child care providers here in the city. And we're happy to report um, we did hire UMass Boston to conduct an independent evaluation of the pilot program, um, which found positive changes in the participants' business practice confidence and leadership efficacy. Um, we also found um, we have have a, a wonderful evaluation from them that also discusses um, how this program was able to keep these providers in business um, when the COVID-19 pandemic struck and quotes saying things like, you know, these, these business skills that I learned on this grant money is what kept me from closing my doors, um, which of course is a story we're hearing all too often these days. Um, so we have another evaluation pending right now of our subsequent cohorts, um, but we hope that it will be just as positive. I'll turn it back over to Alex. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Ali. Um, and I just want to make emphasis on the specifics of the FY22 budget um, projections and um, the funds that MOA is requesting. Specifically, make a big focus on the um, on the amounts that were um, requested for the child care program manager. As Ali um, just went over, these are the numbers and the figures that we have seen, and we projected for FY22. Having someone specifically focus on this um, program will allow um, us to to do much more with the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund and will also allow the office to keep the work, the great work going. Um, I wish we had a whole lot of the time so we can go over and even talk about um, on descriptions of, of providers who have taken the Child Care um, Entrepreneur Fund and how much it has helped them and how much um, it has brought and elevated their confidence when it comes to running their small business. This is something that MOA is very proud of and all the amazing collaboration that we have done in, in departmental and also external. This is not something that we have done alone. Um, I always like to emphasize the fact that partnerships and collaborations is very unique to everything our office does. And I want to extend and even um, find the ways into finding that um, making this possible without the people who have helped to create this um, wouldn't be possible. So i um, very thankful for even having the opportunity to explain our Child Care Entrepreneur Fund and also um, look into the expansion of it for FY22. Happy to take any questions and happy to take any clarifications as well. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, now we will be going to questions, um, and we'll do them both for uh, OED and for um, MOA. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, we're going to go first to uh, Councillor Asabi George, my vice chair, um, and then I believe it is, uh, sorry, colleagues. Um, yeah, Councillor Flynn uh, and then Councillor Flaherty. Councillor Asabi George. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you everyone for this morning's presentation. This may have been the record uh, one hour presentation, but it was very thorough and thoughtful. I've got one question. Uh, I have a number of questions, but I'm going to start with this first one because I think it applies to sort of, you know, all of the things that we've discussed this morning, uh, certainly our small businesses and, and absolutely our child care providers, which are in themselves, many of them small businesses, or they're all small businesses, although some may be nonprofit based. Um, over this last year plus with COVID and the pandemic, we had a number of businesses that went into hibernation. 
Have we surveyed those businesses at all? Do we know how many of them will reopen? Do we know how many we've lost? Has there been, you know, sort of any collection of data or tracking of those businesses who have, who are, in, again, hibernation, shut down, maybe not reopening or will reopen? And then what is the extended plan? If they are reopening, can we double down or triple down with any supports to get those doors reopened? Or uh, can we support them through technical assistance and, and other resources to help them either um rebrand, you know, many of our entrepreneurs become serial entrepreneurs. So there may be other opportunities now on the other side of this pandemic um, in which to uh, engage them. It's a great question, uh, Counselor. Um, so I, I'll start by saying that there is no aggregate data of all of the businesses um, in Boston that have closed or that have been hibernating. A lot of that is word of mouth that we have um, really been able to learn a lot about some of these businesses and talk to some of them um, during the reopening process. Uh, so, you know, I do have some word of mouth data, um, but the city did put together a very simple form to try to understand who was closing. Um, it lives on our website and we've uh, shared it out and asked folks to let us know if a business has closed. Um, but again, this is not, um, this is not hard data. <laughs> this is uh, really just, um, folks who happen to be connected with us. Um, there are some folks who shut down right away. Um, and then, you know, folks who have tried to hold on or, you know, are anticipating opening. And there's a lot of people who don't know what they're doing yet. So I think we won't know anything more um, substantial until later on, but we are working to uh, figure out ways of capturing uh, more of this data. But unfortunately, no, we don't, we don't have those numbers. I'm a, I'm a huge proponent in spending some of that ARP money, a significant amount of, not some, significant amount of the ARP money on supporting our small businesses and our, um, you know, local business owners. We really, I think that that is a real opportunity for us to engage with pr um, proprietors that are in, in need because they may be one grant away or one or two, you know, connections away from reopening or stabilizing and, and, you know, deciding whether or not to reopen. And I think that that's a really important uh, group of people to, to reach out to, because the last thing we need as the city returns to open as, you know, businesses and office spaces reopen and, and residents are returning uh, for those that may have left our city over this last year, we, we don't want them to find empty and vacant storefronts. And, and we have an opportunity, I think, to really support businesses who are uh, unstable right now. Yeah, and I just want to add that um, any business um, can currently get uh, support from our office through TA, marketing, accounting, things like that. Um, uh, you know, and we haven't stopped offering our regular services during the pandemic. And we'll right, continue right. off of that. Um, and one other place where we can maybe find out some of that information is through the Department of Revenue. If it's a retailer or a restaurant food establishment that maybe hasn't uh, been paying their sales tax, or we see that their sales tax uh, contributions or their meals tax contributions or you know whatever it is has gone down significantly, there's got to be indicators maybe at the state level where we can work in partnership with them to identify those businesses that maybe are only open once or twice a week or you know, wh whatever the case might be. Um, we just we, I think we have to proactively go out to go out to them. Um, and try to identify them because you know, I'm a small business owner myself. And as you're trying to keep your head above water and just barely treading water, th the last thing you're thinking about maybe is seeing what resources the city might have for you. And I imagine that the same thing is true for child care providers. Great. Just wanted to add, uh, Counselor, on that. Uh, Natalia is absolutely right. We don't have hard data, but uh, our BPD research team uh, is working uh, to see if we can get more uh, real live data through Google Analytics uh, to see which businesses are closing. Um, and then, so that's an investment that we're making actually this fiscal year. So when we have more, more of that information, we'll be happy to share that uh, with you. One other thing I wanted to note uh, is also is our business has done a survey you know, of small businesses uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, to see, you know, where things are, you know, what kind of help they need. Uh, so, you know, we will we'll look forward to continuing that as we think about what additional uh, investments that might be helpful uh, for this small business. Great. 
And I'll just add on the specific child care side, even though we have not done specific surveys for businesses, we, as if you guys have saw, we have launched um, our child care survey, which I've done specifically um, to understand how parents are finding child care options in the city of Boston, which a lot of the information that we have received has helped us shape a lot of the ways that we look into our research and a lot of the ways we looked into the child care fund specifically. And just to throw out some numbers from um, E, the EEC reopening child care spreadsheet, 608 child cares are open as of October 2020. This was pre and pre COVID was 771. Um, and they had to reopen if they were looking to take vouchers. One of the things that we are seeing specifically in the participants that come to a child care fund is a lot of them are using the funds to look into reopening and are, look, are using the funds to look into what it will look like to reimagine their small businesses as we are more involved in such a digital world world. Um, so happy to share the findings of this year's survey. Once we receive them, we are currently receiving um, answers as we speak. So um, happy to share that information as soon as we have compiled all the information. Excellent. Uh, thank you all. Uh, and again, thank you very much for that thorough presentation. I'm hopeful that it's in our inboxes, Madam Chair. I, I should have looked earlier, but follow it. Is, up. It is. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everybody. Great, thanks so much, uh, Councilor Savi George. Next up, Councilor Flynn, and then it'll be Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Flynn. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Bach, and thank you to the panelists for the outstanding work that you're doing. Um, it's greatly appreciated in helping so many, so many people in need. Um, I guess I have two, two questions or two comments. One is, during this pandemic, we also saw the Asian community, Asian businesses um, hit very hard, not only because of the pandemic, but a lot of people were intentionally staying away from um, Asian-owned businesses because they associated them unfairly um, with, with the coronavirus. And my question is, what are we doing to help them during this difficult time to get them back on their feet? And as, as you know, many of the businesses in the Asian community, a lot of the workers are also Asian, but they also work, they also live directly in the, in, in the nearby neighborhood as well. Um, so not only are you, are you building up an, a business, but you're providing stability to a family in need as well. So. Just want to see what our overall um, efforts are, including challenges with the language as well. Yeah, thank you for that question, Councillor Flynn. Um, so first, I want to say that prior to the official shutdown, um, the city um, did a, a campaign around uh, visiting Chinatown, um, Fields Corner, and other highly Asian um, areas in the city as a way to uh, helping to dispel some of those initial rumors and and. Um, uh, stereotypes at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, over the course of the pandemic, um, Asian uh, businesses have been the highest percentage of recipients of our of our minority subgroups um, of all of our grants. Um, so there has been a lot of intentionality there. Um, our uh, small business conference calls are in three languages, two of which are Asian languages. The Viet it's in Vietnamese, Chinese, and Spanish, um, because those are um, the, the folks who have been um, targeted uh, specifically um, uh, for to connect with us. Um, we've also you know been working really closely with arts and culture around um, the designation of Fields Corner as a little Saigon. We continue to work very closely with um, Chinatown, Main Street, and different Chinatown um, uh, organizations to ensure that uh, those restaurants and business owners in Chinatown have access to our resources. Um, um, we have done a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one outreach in Chinatown to, um, because we know how many restaurants are in Chinatown around um, outdoor dining. 
And there's a lot of barriers there around parking and traffic and, you know, um, even just cultural norms about eating outside is, is, is something that we've learned um, over the course of the pandemic and continue to um, offer and uh, focus on, on these uh, resources uh, to ensure that all of those businesses have access and can obtain um, the services that they need to survive. Thank you. Yeah, we have a good Main Street program in Chinatown, it's doing well, but I think over the summer, we could really use a lot of city resources and support in trying to get, encourage tourists to come to Chinatown and, you know, visit the restaurants, visit the small businesses. I'm trying to get a national volleyball, Asian volleyball tournament um, to come to Boston next year. Um, I'm working with a, a group trying to get that to come to the BCEC and um, its teams from throughout the country and in Canada made up of Asian volleyball players. So um, that'd be several thousand people coming to Boston. Um, and then my final, my final question, um, what, what can we do? What can we do in South Boston on not having a main street program? I know at one time we did have it. It's important <laughs> to me that we, we begin the process of at least considering it, but I, I want to get one done. Um, I think they're critical. I think they play a critical role. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to work hard this coming this coming term to get a, a main street in South Boston. I don't, I don't know if there's any particular reason why we don't have one. Um, so. Yeah, there used to be one, and then the community, um, I think there was a community process that actually dissolved the organization. Um, but um, part of this Reimagine Boston Main Streets is about identifying areas in the city that don't have Main Streets that would want Main Streets, so that that would be part of the, the planning process um, and the um, implementation plan that we will, we will receive. Um, I think uh, part of the engagement has been about whether or not, you know, going into those neighborhoods that don't have main streets and whether or not that is uh, something that can be beneficial. Um, and then I think also understanding ways to support the existing organizations that work with small businesses. Um, a lot of them are merchants associations or business associations or um, even just on the ground nonprofits, CDCs, NDCs that work with small businesses. Um, identifying who those folks are so we can engage them in the conversation. Um, and counselor, if, if you have any additional folks you want to uh, make sure are engaged, please uh, feel free to send them my way. Yeah, th thank you. And I, I just wanted to highlight one issue in South Boston. I represent the, the, the largest number of residents living in public housing, and many of them live in South Boston, near Ellen McCormick, um, old, old Colony, West Broadway, West 9th Street. Um, so they they would like a Main Street program, whether we have it at West Broadway or we have it at East Broadway, but uh, there is no more diverse public housing area in the city than in, in South Boston. So I want to make sure that my constituents also are able to participate in some of these city services. I don't want them to be, I don't want them to be left behind either. Um, so that's, that's my, those are, that's my two cents. Um, thank you, Councilor Bach, and hopefully over the summer we can work on getting a main street or at least getting the discussion going in South Boston, because that's, that's important to me. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Councilor Flynn. Um, next up is Councilor Flaherty, and then it'll be Councilor Mejia. Councilor Flaherty. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good morning uh, to you and to everybody um, and uh, to the chiefs that are here. I appreciate the work that you guys have been doing throughout the pandemic. And in particular, uh, Natalia, I know uh, we've worked very closely on a number of issues and you've been extremely attentive to, to detail and follow up has been excellent. Um, and so I just want to say that from the onset uh, that I appreciate uh, uh, all of your work on, on behalf of our city and, and its people. Um, OED handled uh, disbursement of over 6 million of uh, the city's COVID relief funds uh, up to this point. And I just want to get a sense as to, you know, was was this disbursement of uh, of the money that was fundraised from the Boston Resiliency Fund in, in it, or, and if so, did it include grants? 
And just to let folks know that going forward, uh, state and federal COVID relief funds will be authorized by a, a new city council committee, uh, which I've been asked to chair uh, on behalf of my colleagues. So I, I specifically want to hear about, uh, I guess, the lessons learned with respect to that sort of the first round of COVID relief funding to date and in what, if any, role did grants have in it? So that's one question. The second one is the um, I see OED that uh, runs compliance for Boston residency job policy, and it's 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 getting a significant cut to the budget. And I'm just concerned as to whether or not the program will still be able to run appropriately. And I'm concerned one because you know, obviously the Boston residency job policy is, is important, and we need to be compliant. But I also am hearing sort of stories of city employees having to to move or temporarily change their residence uh, outside the city due to COVID. So it would seem to me that this would be a year for extra funding, not less. Um, and so I, I'd like to get a sense as to uh, how you feel that, that that will be able to operate appropriately. And, and then can you also elaborate on the goals of the reimagined Boston Main Streets program? Um, and does it include uh, efforts to recruit additional business areas into the city as just referenced by my, uh, my colleague and neighbor, uh, Councilor Flynn? Also, as we see a shift in, in residents permanently working in a hybrid work setting, uh, working from home or indoor, only coming into work a couple of days a week. Will there continue to be an increased desire for, you know, for restaurants and retail uh, in the neighborhoods, as well as folks sort of staying closer to their home to get their work done and not coming into the downtown? And I think we ought to start to make some adjustments and be ready for that type of uh, transition to the sort of the, the the normal business district that we're accustomed to. So that's it for me right out of the gate, go uh, right out of the gate. If I can just get some answers to those questions, I would appreciate it. And I'll listen carefully. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Maybe I'll answer your first and third question and then turn it over to Selena. Um, so uh, the first grant, the Small Business Relief Fund grant um, was initially started off um, as a way, so it was before CARES Act even came out or before we even knew anything about CARES Act, we were organizing the balance of our CDBG funds for um, 20, for fiscal year 20. So um, in, yeah, so fiscal year 20. But when the CARES Act funding came in, we were able to make that swap um, almost immediately to use all CARES Act funding. So we did not uh, use any dollars that were fundraised through the Boston Resiliency Fund. Those uh, dollars were very specifically earmarked to support students and schools and food and um, other emergency needs. Um, small businesses were not under that umbrella. So we used all CARES Act funding and it was all um, through that grant that we were able to, um, to uh, support those businesses. Uh, to date in all using CARES Act funding, it's over 16.6 .6 million um, to over 4,500 businesses through different grant programs, but they've all been through the federal CARES Act money. Um, and then as far as reimagine uh, main streets um, absolutely we are looking at what other areas of the city um, may need a main street or how we can support other main street uh, other commercial districts um, through the city's um, small business program so um, we don't have um, any clear definition of exactly where or what that will look like yet we are in the still in that process of that um, research and analysis um, but we will have hopefully an answer um, this fall. I hope that answers your questions. It does, Natalia, thank you. And Councillor Flaherty, um, in terms of the the funding for, for BRJP, I, I appreciate you keeping a close eye on that. Um, I believe that's, that's more of an accounting issues so uh, as as we reported we actually have two new positions um so we have a, a larger budget than we've ever had for brjp as well as the the full-time contractor i think that those funds are now living centrally with oed and then they get allocated at a later point to the different line items so i think it's it's still and midori feel free to if i'm if i'm getting that correctly, the, the money's still there. It's just not showing up in, in the line item at this moment, but it's just an accounting issue. It's not a, a decrease in the commitment to the work. You are correct. Um, the economic development, equity inclusion, um, you know, we've decided to centralize the budget. 
uh, and then to just figure out, you know, throughout the year where the priorities and investment should be made. Uh, so the line item that you're specifically seeing for BRJP uh, is not reflective of the the investments that are, uh, we're making, as Selena mentioned. Thank you to both chiefs and Madam Chair. If you could just, uh, you know, just re, you know, make make a note of that for the record that uh, this looks like this is sort of an accounting issue and or monies coming in from one area and going to the other area, just so we we're mindful of it. Absolutely. Thank, you. thank you everyone for your time and attention and to your commitment to the city and appreciate it. Look forward to working with you guys continued into the future. Great. Thank you so much, Councilor Flaherty. And yes, um, we're uh, we're aware that in the in the creation of the equity cabinet, there's a number of things moving around. Um, so definitely tracking that. Um, next up is uh, and Madam Chair, if, if I may just interject. So this happened several years ago when there was the creation of a department um, in Christine O'Donnell probably uh, does absolutely knows it better than I do in terms of when when a uh, department is created, if it doesn't, if it's not created with the uh, consent um, from the council, then it creates a whole different set of situations where they're not able to collect funds. Christine can could have probably pointed to the yep. sort of the, the actual verse of that. So this may be a situation where if a committee was created, that it probably should be uh, come through the council for approval. Um, and that may be something we can talk to, to the administration about. But just again, my institutional knowledge, it's not the only department and or area where um, our department was created by executive order, wasn't created sort of normally through the legislative process. And when that happens, um, funding has to follow a different mechanism. I would ask that maybe this is the appropriate time, Madam Chair, to talk about a cure and let's uh, and let's have that, that department and how it was created have it created properly and have it come through the council for council approval. They're going to continue to, you know, to 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 provide the, the great value and function that they are, but it will be, I guess for the lack of a better word, it will be a legit department. It will be a legit committee, if you will, that can accept and disperse funds. So again, just my two cents, Christine O'Donnell knows it better than I do, but I know I raised this issue years ago when this department was was being created and I thought at some point it would become a problem. And this is the type of issue. It's like we got funds coming in, but they can't accept them, receive them. It has to go through another door and through another avenue yeah. and around and around and around. It's like, let's just come before the council. Let's approve it as a legit committee and let's move forward. Yeah. No, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. And I'm aware of that challenge. And in fact, um, I think the, the real challenge is that there is a plethora of such offices and departments. Um, the uh, administration really has fallen behind in asking council um, permission for um, properly constituting them. And I agree with you that there needs to be a sort of overall um, reckoning and bringing those things into alignment in order to um, in order to enable like proper accounting and so there's not as much kind of shells moving around um, I do think our challenge is that it's more than just this there are a like a pretty like I said a pretty substantial number so um, I'm not sure that we have the legislative time to get it done before June um, but I strongly agree with you that it needs to happen and that there's a kind of, there has been a kind of systematic disregard to the- oh, I agree. Uh, and, I, and I'm happy to work with you on it. I know it's, it's, it's previous administrations. It's the sort of the motto has been, it's easier to ask for, uh, for forgiveness than it is for permission. So, but there's a lot of this and we need to clean this up. Uh, you know, we have a fiduciary responsibility for the residents and the taxpayers of Boston to make sure that things work appropriately pursuant to the charter. And this is just one example of several others that I concur with you and I will roll up the sleeves and work with you when time permits that we can get it done. I'll, I'll assist. Great. Thanks so much, Councillor Flaherty. Um, next up is Councillor Mejia. Um, and uh, then um, I will uh, slot Councillor Braden back into the order because she was the first one here and she had to step away for a minute. But Councillor Mejia, you're, you're up next. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for the presentation and thank you for all your hard work, especially during these times. I am so encouraged and grateful. Um, so I only have a few questions um, for women's advancement. I'm curious in um, FY21, the Child Entrepreneur Fund is supporting its first entirely non-English speaking cohort of in, um, childcare providers with workshops and materials um, in Spanish. What is the plan to support cohort of providers who speak languages beyond English and Spanish. And then in some of the performance goals listed has decreased in FY21 due to leadership quote unquote turnover. Um, what plans do we have in the future to, to ensure that we're still providing the same level of service even when there is a leadership turnover? 
And then I have a question for um, Office of Economic Development. A lot of barber shops and hair salons have been reaching out to our office to complain about their um, personal property taxes on things like barber chairs. And how are we communicating to them what is expected of business owners who operate barber shops and hair salons when it comes to personal property taxes? So I'm happy to take the first question about the Spanish speaking cohort. Thank you, Counselor. Um, so our application is available in 10 languages. We have only gotten applications in Spanish and English thus far. Um, we are expanding our outreach to work more closely with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement and the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services um, in order to try to permeate more um, groups of folks who are not speaking languages besides Spanish and English. Um, our outreach materials are currently offered in English, Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian, Creole, and Chinese. Um, but we will be offering those in 10 languages as well with the next cohort. Um, we don't turn away anyone due to interpretation needs. So we do provide simultaneous translation for all the workshops in whatever language anyone might need. Um, but thus far, we have received primarily Span Spanish and English applicants. Um, we did have uh, some Cantonese speakers in the first cohort that we provided interpretation for. Um, if we receive a, enough um, selected applicants who speak in language besides Spanish or English, we'd be happy to take them and form a cohort if there's at least 10 of them, enough to justify the, um, the separate cost of obtaining a um, instructor who speaks that language. And if United Way, of course, is able to provide an instructor in that language, we'd be happy to, to create um, more, co more cohorts so folks can enjoy the benefits of being able to share um, a common language. Um, so that is certainly our hope that we'll have more folks who are speaking um, the same language and, and a wider variety of languages going forward. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Alex for the next question. Yeah, I just want to echo um, Ali's point on our translation. And um, like I mentioned earlier during the presentation, this is where our collaborations are a big, big component of what we do in MOA. And uh, that collaboration is through United Way to assure that we are able to have the instructors who speak the different languages and also offer the on-site translation um, for languages who are not um, who are not just Spanish and English, there are just others coming in as well. And pertaining to your question in regard regarding to um, the structure change for the Women's Workforce Council. Currently, they are accepting, um, they're collecting the information as we speak. Um, and as we are, I am more than happy to share um, the findings that they receive once the collection is all finished. Um, I'm pretty excited about the new um, the new leadership that the Women's Workforce Council has come. We have a really great relationship with Kim and everyone else in the council. So I'm more than happy to share that information um, as soon as we receive them. And going to your last question, Counselor, um, so I think there's kind of two parts to this. One is um, anything that has to do with personal property taxes, I defer to the assessing uh, team on, on the specifics of those questions. But the second part of your question, which was um, what are we doing to ensure that businesses know what they need to be doing? Um, there's one thing in particular around barber shops and um, beauty salons where um, individuals are contracting with the business owner right the the retail the whoever owns that retail space or is renting that retail space that's a um, individual contract between the barber and the business owner um, but we consider them obviously all um, independent businesses um, as long as they you know uh, identify in that way with us so um, they can all reach out to us and, and get um, support um, the second piece is you know through our small business conference calls we have um, and reopening work webinars and workshops we have engaged uh, barbers, um, hairstylists, et cetera, um, throughout the reopening process to just kind of give clarity and answer questions. And um, again, we right now we have like five different platforms where people can just join in at their convenience and, and get support and get their questions answered. Um, our uh, virtual office hours, our reopening office hours, um, MWBE office hours, um, our you know Tuesday calls as well as uh, via email. Um, so I encourage you, you know, to connect those businesses directly with our team and we will do everything that we can to support them, whatever the individual issue is. Thank you. Do I have time for one more question, Councilor Bach? 
Yeah. Um, so I'm encouraged by all of these great responses. I am, as we start thinking about reopening and all things that deal with going back to quote unquote normal, I'm curious, what are some of the greatest um, challenges that you are foreseeing and uh, uh, what are some of the things, not just the challenges, but where you see the opportunities for the next set of, of, of supports that some of these businesses are going to need aside from capital and financial? Have you been able to think about what are some of the other um, areas of concern that we can get ahead of? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the, the the council has done a great job of bringing some of these things to light, like commercial vacancies and displacement, things that we're um, excited to uh, tackle in the next you know coming year and, and figure out creative solutions around some of that stuff. I'm also really um, encouraged by um, our focus on helping businesses grow and um, you know not just uh, survival during the pandemic, but how do we continue to enhance uh, business growth? Um, a big chunk of that right now is our workshop series. We've been hosting um, almost weekly workshops, if not two times a week, on different elements about business structure that are absolutely free and open to all businesses to participate in. Um, that Those are part of our economic development center that are run through, uh, through the small business team. Um, and I, you know, I'm really encouraged to see the number of people turning out for those uh, that builds connections with us and relationships. It helps us support businesses in the long term. And we've seen a lot of business owners um, and entrepreneurs come back to those uh, workshops to every single one. Um, so we'll be continuing to see that and we'll be continuing to, you know, put on these workshops and trainings in, um, in the next fiscal year as well, um, because those are part of like what we do. Anyway, and I think uh, virtually um, doing some of those workshops, I think, has actually helped increase attendance and um, the connection. So we'll continue to do that. Yeah, thank you. And I did say was one more question that I just thought of, and this will go to Alexandra and um, Midori, maybe, perhaps. I'm curious, mm -hmm. you know, there's been some studies about uh, women who have left the workforce, and I'm just curious what efforts and what are you hearing in terms of how we can support um, the high rate of women who have left the workforce due to COVID, and what are we doing to help bring them back in? Yeah, that, that's a really great question. I was as as as, as Nata, Natalia was speaking, I was the light bulb in the back of my head. But um, great that you asked that. Um, definitely flexibility in the workplace. Um, it's one of the main things that we have to think about when we go back and think about what it will look like to go back to some type of normal. Um, and also assuring that when women do get back in the workplace, that we have flexibility when it comes to childcare um, and providing and finding innovative time when it comes not just the nine to five, but also being able to assure that we are focusing on those non-standard hours, childcare providers. Not everyone is lucky enough, privileged enough to have a nine to five job. We're talking about the um, overnights, the after hours. Um, that's something that we need to sit down and think about more. And one of a great example that we're focused on that is our collaboration with Community Labor United, which as of right now, there's currently doing some research and a pilot program testing what it looks like to run non-standard hours childcare. Um, and that's something that it's definitely um, that as we think about reopening and as we also think about what, what it looks like, what it looks like to go back to the workplace is very important for us to just to focus on and also take a moment and sit back and look at the importance of this flexibility and the importance to push more employers to think about um, finding all these resources to help women come back into the workplace. Thank you. And I see the gavel and I don't have any further questions. Thank you so much for all your hard work. It's appreciated. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, um, Councillor Mejia. Uh, Councillor Braden, then Councillor Campbell, then Councillor Edwards. Councillor Braden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for um, accommodating my jumping in and out here. Um, and I'm sure I've missed some very important comments. So please, uh, please forgive my uh, redundancy if I'm asking questions that have already been asked. Um, the childcare sector. Um, so the the, the family uh, childcare providers are an essential piece of our um, infrastructure, and I just want to know. Um, how aggressive are we being in trying to grow and support that sector? I know um, my own local experience here is that many of our uh, family child care providers decided during COVID to give up and maybe not come back. So that's an important uh, piece of concern. Um, 
I'm delighted to hear you're doing workshops in terms of um, workshops for providers in terms of skill building. Uh, are there workshops for people who are just maybe prospectively investigating the possibility of setting up a, a childcare um, and and all the nuts and bolts of of how to do it and and in terms of regulatory uh, compliance, etc. And, and that answer that question might already have been answered. Um, then in terms of uh, tracking development, um, I, I'm really concerned about development driven displacement of small businesses, especially in the creative sector, but I'll, I'll not notwithstanding other small businesses that, that um, we're seeing a huge loss of, of formerly light industrial space that was ideal for uh, artists and performance related businesses and uh, creative film and film and video work. So uh, are we tracking displacement of those businesses? Um, I'm thinking about Alston Brighton, but I'm also thinking about East Boston, other neighborhoods that have a, a, an intense level of, of de redevelopment. Um, and also in terms of do we track landlords who are bad actors in terms of how they treat their um, their small business, uh, like aggressive increases in rent, um, not maintaining buildings, um, you know, pretty hostile uh, lease, leasing uh, tactics? Uh, do we track those landlords and have we any recourse to try and bring them back into line? And uh, then we used to have, under the Menino administration, we had a back streets program that's similar to main streets that focused on um, you know, trying to uh, provide space and support our small industries, small light industry and small businesses that work in auto, auto repair and, and et cetera. Um, are we tracking the loss of those those businesses as well? Um, and then also um, the, the, the capacity to be able to stand up and support uh, cooperative kitchen spaces and other small startups like that. So that's a whole bundle of questions that have been <laughs> accumulating. So um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Um, so yeah, tracking displacement is really, really, really complicated because um, there is no like enforcement tool um, that currently exists at the city level uh, to be able to one even know who landlords are, oftentimes, and two um, to to manage that um, as as well as. Um, you know, we've brought in uh, the assessing department to help um, inform that in the past, and, and we're continuing to do that. I think part of what um, I'm excited about um, in the coming um, coming years is really about building those relationships more strategically with landlords and, and figuring out ways to support. Um, I think the other piece is uh, we have been um, in conversations around kind of like new developments and and ensuring that there is retail on the on the store uh, on the ground level and how the city can help businesses um, access those spaces. Um, not necessarily in the displacement side, obviously, but this is more in the new space um, and preventing those spaces from sitting vacantly or um, you know bringing in outside um, businesses. Um, there is no formal way of doing this. We are doing it kind of. Um, case by case basis and really, uh, you know, supporting um, businesses uh, just very quickly back on the displacement side, like we oftentimes will help businesses do lease negotiations uh, through our TA um, or, you know, um, uh, you know, get support during those those moments, but there is no legal or formal way for us to track uh, displacement or bad landlords. And I'll just chime in with the child care to answer your question, Counselor. Currently, we do accept startups to our child care entrepreneur fund. Um, and this is one of the specifics that we also like to, um, to highlight a lot, especially when we're doing uh, reach engagement um, during for applicants to apply for the fund. Um, the, the funds that we do give, they're specific also to help startups in the child care entrepreneur fund as well as their small businesses. And this is why um, it's so important for us to be able to have our new child 
child care program manager because it will also let us um, better guide startups in the city of Boston and those who do reach out when it comes to guidance and more information as to how to start as, um, a child care in the city of Boston. Um, this is a great opportunity. Is why I, I'm a huge, I mentioned again, the word collaboration and the, and the possibility even looking to collaborate even more when it comes to what it will look like for us to be able to help when it comes to um, referring and when it comes to engaging specifically to licensors. As unfortunately, EEC is, um, is a specific licensor for, for child care providers, but definitely the Office of Women's Advancement stands as a huge support system. I wanted to answer a question on the back streets. Uh, so, uh, buddy, you brought it up. Uh, so, we do have a staff person uh, in our team uh, who is a director of manufacturing in um, industrial. Uh, so he is original Backstreets uh, manager from uh, 20, 30 years ago. And I know back then there were more team uh, members on that. Uh, so we are keeping a close eyes uh, on this industry, right? As uh, uh, you know, the, a lot of these, what we're seeing is a lot of these uh, uh, industry is shifting towards more advanced manufacturing, right? From more the traditional uh, brick and mortar. Uh, so we are uh, in constant communication with our businesses uh, in Reedville, in Hyde Park, as well as the new market, market area, right? Uh, we're seeing a lot more breweries uh, pop up. Uh, we're seeing a lot more of the startup uh, in the green and blue uh, tech economy uh, convert themselves, right? Uh, to build a, you know, blue bike, a, a bike that's, you know, uh, does fancy things and um, uh, all kinds of things. So uh, certainly this is, this is you know, something that uh, we've been keeping an eye on and we've been working very closely with their state uh, uh, department as well, because uh, that's their, uh, one of their key sectors that they're focused on in addition to IT and health sector. Um, so to make sure that we can um, uh, refer folks to resources uh, and guidance uh, as needed. Thank you. Just as a follow up for the e, um, reference to EEC, I just heard from a, ch a family child care provider yesterday that the federal um, the federal government has, has is making a grant to a family child care providers, um, and it's been administered through the e e EEC at the state level. Um, but they are being asked to fill out extensive forms, um, and if if the money is not claimed, and there's a short timeline. If the money's not claimed, that that money will stay with the EEC. And I think our providers are rather indignant that, first of all, if they're registered child care providers in Massachusetts, that they should be able to get that money without having to go fill out four pages of a, of a, of a form. And also, there was a, a question raised about accessibility in terms of language access. So my, my, my concern is that because there's a certain administrative and bureaucratic barrier here, that the monies that were granted by the federal government to support our child care providers will not actually get to the child care providers because they have to jump through these hoops. So anything you can do to expedite that process or smooth it out would be really helpful. And again, this is only anecdotal report from one child care provider, but I'm sure it applies to many. Thank you. I wish we were able to, to be able to speed up the process and help with it when it comes to EEC, but just to speak on behalf of MOA and the city, um, every time we have an application, every time we do a grant, we assure that it's translated among our top 10 languages in the city of Boston. We take that in consideration very thoroughly, and it's very important to us to assure that we are looking at equity and diversity at all forms when it comes to applicants and when it comes to any programming for providers. We do understand um, that it is very important to assure that our materials are written, our specific reading level, that there are enough information is written, and it's not something so excessive that providers will look at and not want to fill out. Um, so this is something that's very, very important to us. As for me, um, English language learner, I make sure that everything we do is looked at with a way. Yeah. That someone who doesn't understand English um, as, as a first language, that I can look at the piece of paper and say, oh, I understand what I'm reading. So this is definitely... Yeah. I, th I think I, it was not a criticism of your great work in, in, in the city. I think it's a level of frustration with the EEC that, that they've put this bureaucratic hurdle that, that I know there will be child care providers will not get the money that has been granted to them by the federal government because of this hurdle. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm just um, letting off some steam here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Councillor Braden, thanks so much. I am, we're going to go next to Councillor Campbell and then Councillor Edwards. Councillor Campbell. Thank you, um, and thank you, uh, 
everyone for the hard work you're doing and the incredible work you're doing in the midst of COVID. It's, it's not easy. So thank you. Um, and you guys are doing the hard work. Um, so I just have a few questions. Many of them were already answered um, because they were asked by previous colleagues. Uh, the first is for, as we talk about getting people back to work, we've been uh, there's been a lot of conversations on workforce development programming, training programming. Does the city currently um, offer any type of workforce development programming that is stipend or has the city explored that? Because that's been coming up quite a bit um, as a great tool to be able to get people new skills and to get them into the careers they want. So that's my first question. And then my second question is, do we know how many women have successfully increased their wages after taking the workshops in 2018, 2019, and 2020? I'll start with those and then I have uh, just a couple more. Yeah, so I can take the workforce development question. So, Thank you, Majori. Um, so the, our, you know, we have our Office of Workforce Development uh, that funds, um, you know, over uh, you know, 100 nonprofit organizations, workforce development providers uh, each year uh, using our federal state uh, city dollars. Uh, and so this uh, notion of using stipend, uh, they've done it uh, certainly uh, you know, through their grant making process, specifically for people with Corey, right? Uh, people who are re-entering the society. That's the one of the tools that's been uh, known to work uh, is that let's get them some stipends, right? Get their feet on the ground, get their some work experience uh, before then they go into a workforce uh, fully. You know, we've also used it with other, you know, uh, population like the immigrant population, uh, you know, single mothers. And, you know, so we leave it up to the uh, workforce development providers because they are really the expertise on the populations that they serve. Uh, and uh, we also run Youth Options Unlimited uh, program through the Office of Workforce Development, and they work primarily with uh, young adults uh, with uh, who are gang involved or have a quarry. Uh, so that their programming specifically stipended uh, workforce development program uh, for that population. That's helpful, and and as we continue to have conversations on this, um, in the in just how they're proven to work, really looking to see how the city in partnership can continue to sort of create more stipend programming or encourage folks to do it on the provider side. So that's helpful. Um, and then I just had a question on the the workshops and the effect we're actually seeing on wages for women. Do we track data? Do we do surveys? Just for clarification, Councilor, you're referring to the child care workshops or are you referring to our salary negotiation workshops? The salary negotiation workshops. Thank you. Um, as of right now, there was an evaluation by the AUW. Uh, I would love to, I would definitely look more into it if it does include and covers that specific. Um, but we are currently right now, as you speak, which I'm really excited, uh, we're looking into um, what it would look like for expansion of that program as we are thinking about reopening. I'm happy to share more thoughts once we have a final and how it looks like, but just wanted to give that, that we are looking into expanding the program. Okay. Yeah, anything, feel free to email it over to us um, and my chief of staff, Ellie, who obviously you guys know that would be great. And then a few other questions. One is, um, been talking to some folks with respect to Main Street districts, neighborhoods, um, around the work that's happening there. And something that came up, a question from one of our constituents is, has the city ever looked into um, parking benefits districts for the Main Streets? I know MAPC is doing some work there. Um, so this has come up in a few different areas. So I'm just, I figured I'd ask the question at this hearing. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, so yes, uh, we have talked about uh, parking benefit uh, districts with the BPD, sorry, but the BTD um, uh, in the past. Um, not all Main Street districts actually have um, have uh, meters um, and so are not collecting parking revenue. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be a, an equitable way of funding or supporting Main Street districts, but it is something that we're exploring, um, uh, but we don't have anything re to report at this time. And nothing exists right now. It's just sort of a, still an exploratory phase. Yes, correct. Okay. And then two other questions. Um, one is around the, B, uh, the BJRP. And, you know, there's been a lot of hearings and conversations on enforcement and what enforcement looks like. There can be a punitive piece to that. But I'm just curious what other incentives have been explored with respect to compliance um, with the BJRP policy um, and just, just that. I mean, things that are sort of more that are non-punitive, but are still incentives to get people to apply to comply. 
Am I asking this in the wrong hearing? Alina, do you want to take that? I'm so sorry. Could you please repeat that? Hi, Selena. Um, I was asking, obviously, there's been a lot of conversation around enforcement with respect to the job res and residency policy, punitive sometimes in nature. I'm just curious if there have been other non-punitive incentives that have been explored to get folks to comply with that policy. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked because this is an area that we could really use um, some fresh thinking on. The couple of things that, that we've thought of, because we have the new Salesforce system, part of the challenge with it and, and why we continue to have problems is that in the previous system, people would sort of email us spreadsheets and we would enter them into the system. And so there was a way for us to catch if there was any anything that looked off, any data inconsistencies. Now, the beauty of the system is that GCs and subs are entering their own information. So in theory, it's real time. You can look at it. It, it doesn't require that kind of like emailing and data entry. But what happens is that if there's errors, it's really hard to catch until you start seeing things that don't really line up or formulas that come back with an E. And so one of the things that um, our, our deputy director and our new Salesforce administrator are going to establish our office hours for Salesforce support so that subcontractors, it's just very decentralized. So even if you go through the GC, it's like subs are entering their own data. Not every sub is mobilized every single day. So it's just really hard to kind of catch people um, to, to kind of have any kind of formal engagement. And so we're going to start offering um, office hours so people can just drop in. And already the construction monitors pro provide that support, but um, we're just seeing a lot of data entry issues that are really hampering the system. So that's one thought. The other thought that I've been kicking around, and I just share it with you because I know you all are such good thought partners, but it's, it's not it's not baked. It's not even in, in the bowl yet, but um, ways to highlight people that are doing really well under BRJP, GCs and subs that are really um, committing and delivering on the goals, highlighting best practices that they've had. And so um, I, I think that there would be that would be really helpful both just to, to put that out there, but also I think for our city buyers to know, um, I see you, Councillor Bach. Um, so yeah, so that's another thought I wanted to throw out there. <laughs> that's helpful and we'll stay in touch uh, on that for sure because I've been thinking about that quite a bit. It's just how do you, it doesn't have to be monetary, right? It could be a branding sticker from the city or something that you know really celebrates those folks who are doing great, not just with that policy, but other businesses who are really doing their part. And my last question, I saw the gavel and I'm, I'm ignoring it. <laughs> Kelterbach, you got to love us. This is my last question. And it, it really is a broad question, um, which are just what are some of the greatest challenges that our small businesses are facing that, frankly, we are not able to address or not in a, in a position to address? You know, I often think you, we put a lot on all of your departments to do a lot, but um, sometimes someone else needs to step up. So I'm just curious from just a high level what, what some of the challenges are that we as a city are just unable to address. That's my last question. Thank you, Councilor Bach. That's a great last question. <laughs> um, I will uh, just start off by saying that um, commercial rents, commercial affordability, commercial vacancies, com commercial you know, displacement, these are all things that happen in a private contract um, off the radar. And while we are working on um, figuring out how, how the city can play a more vital role, it is something that inadvertently does not necessarily belong in our threshold, or do we have any type of enforcement power there? I think additionally, probably a little bit more abstract is, is we, you know, we, a lot of the businesses that are um, struggling right now really depend on tourism and depend on bodies. They need people, um, you know, uh, especially our downtown businesses that have been more, more impacted than even our neighborhood businesses. Um, and these are things that I think um, with be local and all inclusive and just in general vaccination rates and, you know, the world seemingly um, will be opening up. I think these are things that the city can play a role in, but we don't control. And, and really, um, you know, I think survival of a business is revenue. They need to have people buying the thing that they're selling. And um, part of that is, um, you know, we're working on how to help them, you know, 
go on the digital space or, you know, go online or even think about succession planning and, you know, thing, things that could help small business owners really succeed. But um, just remember every single business owner has a unique story, unique needs, and there isn't unfortunately a silver bullet that can support all small businesses. And so that's why our team's work is like very, you know, intentional and it's, it's one-on-one -on -one work that doesn't oftentimes give a lot of space for for helping hundreds of businesses at a time, aside from, you know, these grant programs. So I think continuing to support um, them in the ways that we do and, and, you know, expanding capacity for my team is always a way that we can help. But some of these things are outside of our control and um, not sure, you know, what the city could actually do to, to improve some of these things that we aren't already doing. Thank, Thank you. And, oh, go ahead, I'll let you finish and then I'm done talking. Thank you. Also, I said, I see the gavel, but I'm going to just go in really, really quick. Um, and just to make emphasis one more time on what, and the point we made earlier about workflow flexibility and when it comes to affordable child care, we need to make sure that outside in the industries and other organizations and other employers are also look at, looking at the fact, how can we bring back women into the workforce and how can we continue to do this with being and having that flexibility? Um, child care impacts all of our capacity, and we need to look at that and as a priority and to how we incorporate that when it comes to the workforce. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, I feel, yes, the gavel's mechanism seems to be breaking down today. Um, uh, Councillor Edwards, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, a couple questions. I wanted to first, uh, first of all, thank um, thank you guys for your incredible leadership and your creativity at this moment. Um, I came in and heard a lot about your Boston uh, incentive program for the dollars. And uh, I think that's incredible. I, th I, I love that the city is going to be reimbursing and really helping people and, and small businesses um, attract, I think, even more customers and incentivize going local. So that is, that is, that's wonderful. I wanted to thank you for that. And I want to highlight those things, also the increased amount of money for uh, the, um, the child care program as well with the Office of um, from an advancement. So I, I wanted to highlight the, the, those good things. I think that's creativity. I look forward to cooperatives being uh, more childcare cooperatives being part of that conversation. I think we've learned to be mutually dependent on each other in this moment. And so where those some of those infrastructures are going to stay, especially in East Boston, we have a, a cooperative incubator, CCDS, um, where that's going to stay and grow. I really hope that they'll be hopefully part of getting some of that those funds and, and working with you. Um, so some questions I do have. Um, I wanted to start with the Boston jobs policy. Um, in the last hearing we had on that, you know, we have our biannual um, hearing and, and then I had a follow-up conversation with the coalition. And so has the, have you, has the office thought about paying some of these volunteers and or putting out an RFP for on-site uh, people to come there specifically to monitor the work sites? Uh, because work sites aren't just all nine to five and they aren't all like for the entire duration of the project. It's sometimes 24 hours, sometimes this, they're out, they move a crew in, they move and so on and so forth. Have you thought about re a true partnership at the level of, a, like to make sure that a lot of those folks are being held accountable? I know Salesforce is in the pipeline and still working on, but there's nothing like people just showing up to see who's there. So that's one thing. And I, I, I would I would be a huge proponent of that, actually. I think there are a lot of people putting in free labor, trying to make sure that the law that the city has is actually is is, is actually working. Um, I also wanted to follow up on High Roads Kitchens, and to see if that program is going to be enhanced and in what way, shape, or form. Um, because there's one thing to be supporting restaurants and local businesses; it's another to be supporting them to come back better, stronger, and with higher wages. And that's something you know. Uh, I think Councilor Box said this so eloquently once: where we can't just be fighting to come back to what we had. We need to be fighting to come back to better and to be a better city and a better employment culture, all of those things as well. If we're going to be in the fight for something, it can't just be for what we already had, which is people who work in the restaurant industry making, you know, tip minimum wages, not making enough to pay their bills before. So, um, so there's high roads kitchen, there's um, paying on-site monitors. And then I also was curious specifically about 
um, working with um, the restaurants and liquor licenses. We had put that on the table before about potentially buying some of those licenses back to help infuse restaurants with some money um, or, or at least trying to work with them and seeing if there's a way to infuse them with uh, lump sums based off of some of the assets that they have um, that include space. So I'm, I just, I'll start with those three things. Happy to go first um, on the High Road, Road Kitchens um, uh, grant program. Uh, so yes, I think uh, there's um, appetite to continue it on in some way. Obviously, um, you know uh, firsthand and really well um, that uh, part of the process after the grant was distributed was to keep them connected with um, High Road Kitchens um, and the One Fair Wage folks so that they um, could continue that on. Um, so I think I don't have immediate next steps, but I do think that there is uh, appetite for that because we want to make sure um, restaurants can continue on. Um, Part of it might be, you know, continuing to help them with funding, uh, but uh, there may be other ways in which we can support. But at this time, I don't have anything to report. I'm, I'm happy to hear just the commitment, and I look for maybe we can set that meeting up then. Absolutely. The okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councilor Edwards, for for your commitment to our city's workers. Um, I I think that. Um, you know, we're, we're open to, to looking at different models for monitoring. We did add two additional monitors, which means that each monitor will, will have less of a, a workload. Um, the other is that um, our monitors haven't been able to be on site for due to COVID restrictions for a lot of this past fiscal year. Um, and so I think that one, you know, we're, we're now returning uh, we're, we're not going to be resuming the in-person site visits. Um, I think it's an issue. I, if, if you were to ask me, I think that the key issue with achieving the goals is the pipeline and that uh, um, a lot of the unions don't have, can't provide the, the resident workers, people of color and women. You know, we just had a, we just had a back meeting yesterday. There was all machine operators were mobilized on site. The numbers were terrible, you know, so I, I don't, we can monitor that, right? But but it's not, you know, people are reporting, so they're in compliance. They're sending us the reports on time and, and the numbers are not good. And, and I think that in in-person monitoring helps with, for example, seeing subs that, that we're not getting timesheets for, or seeing if there's if if the residency numbers actually line up with what's being reported reporting. But in terms of moving the numbers, I don't know how much we know they're not on, we know they're not there, right? And so um, being, seeing it in person or seeing it in the reports, I think that um, I'd be interested in really looking at those pipeline questions and how we can really, um, because it's it's really frustrating um, when we, in people that are doing great, they're reporting on time, they're, they're verifying their workers, they're complying. Um, so I, it actually did come up yesterday at the back that we might need to revisit. It came up from the chairman and, and, and some of the commissioners that um, it might be worth looking at the policy itself um, because we can be doing everything right and the numbers are still what, what they are. You know, we, we and the GCs, right, can be following it to the letter of the law and still have really poor numbers. Right. And so I think that that's where the frustration comes for well, one, I still think it's an opportunity for community partnership and considering working with and community organizers and putting out a small RFP to monitor either in district or around the city on certain projects, I think is actually a, a still a bridge to be built. Um, and and then also a reward for the amount of work that they did. That Their coalition is the reason why we have a, um, a Boston residence jobs policy. It's their work that put it in there and they're trying to enforce it basically as a labor of love and commitment. So I, one, I still think there should be a commitment from the city to work with them and possibly consider an RFP put out there. Two, when you say the numbers are horrible and when, you, when we admit that we're not where we are supposed to be, that's where I think a lot of people get frustrated. Then why are we still allowing these projects to go forward? Why are we not enforcing it why are we why why are we just saying well it's horrible and and that's it that's where i think a lot of people get angry so what's the point in the law if we're going to all admit it's 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 not working and you, we can look at the pipeline 
I know Travis has some different ideas about other pipelines and other places to go that might not be union. But I mean, I do know the statistics are pretty clear. Unions still have more diversity than most non-union shops, most, right? I think it's the MBE um, shops that actually have um, the diversity if they're not union. But we're we're still in, in, in an issue about, yes, pipeline, but the city can only do so much so far down if the law is the law of the city, enforce it. I, I right, feel, but we are enforcing the law, which is that people have to submit report. Like the law doesn't provide for because we can't. It's it's a similar situation to the disparity study where we can't prove that there are resident workers that have the right licenses available for that project at that time. So we can't sanction based on not meeting the goal, but we can sanction if they're not reporting, if they're not verifying their residents, if they're not attending pre-construction meeting, you know, so, and in that, that ordinance was, was developed through the leadership of Chuck Turner and community activists. So I, you know, I, I think that I would love to really sit down with you and, and some of the, the closer advocates to, cause I know we don't have the time here to discuss it, but I, we really do would love to revisit um, because the the goal is to get resident people of color and women on there and um and the, the tools we have don't give us the ability to enforce yeah. that i don't i right so maybe what i'm saying is maybe then we need to enforce uh, change the law so that it is a goal oriented enforcement versus the compliance of just simply submitting information um we what would what you had suggested uh, earlier of good actor list, I think what would also be helpful is a bad actor list um, uh, that you are, Beck is just transparent. You, when you say that, that this particular group or this particular project has failed miserably, I think it should be public acknowledgement too. So who's not doing well? Absolutely. And we do, we can do that with the existing ordinance. So that is something that we're working on. And then um, I know, I know Councilor Bach, I see the gavel, but you know what? Yeah, man. Anyway, so one of the other, one of the other um, uh, concerns I have and, and I've brought up many, many times and I'll always bring up is the communication between your office and workforce development. You know, there's, there's, there's something I cannot abide by and that is you know, a bad actor that doesn't pay their workers, right? There's one thing and violating other laws or we had bad actors who have violated OSHA laws and, and then still went on and then we saw recently the deaths of two workers. So, so how are you monitoring that? How are you monitoring the connection of when you violate some major workplace safety issues to the point that people have died on that? or you have wage theft issues and you have not paid workers, how are we monitoring to make sure that those workers, those bad actors don't come or step foot in the city of Boston again? Is yeah. that a priority? Yeah, so the Office of Workforce Development, their main um, kind of uh, work is to uh, provide grants to workforce development programs to uh, train folks uh, to access some of the jobs uh, that are in Boston. Uh, primarily, these are Boston residents. Uh, uh, majority of people are uh, people of color. Uh, they are either being uh, upskilled, right, uh, in the current uh, industry, or uh, are being retrained to go into a different sector. Um, so I know they also have a waste theft um, kind of a, a, a division over there, uh, but they work very closely with the Attorney General's office uh, on that matter. We don't have a legal enforcement uh, rights within out of that office. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to kind of look further into it uh, and get back to you uh, uh, on that. Yeah, I just want to be clear. I'm not asking you to enforce anything. I'm asking you to not contract or give uh, preference to or to basically hold accountable to people who don't pay people or kill their workers. And I, I don't, and I've been asking about this in every single B, Boston resident job policy uh, hearing we've had, um, specifically about your relationship and acknowledgement and knowledge of wage theft. And when those there are bad actors not paying their workers, why isn't that part of, I don't know, the your analysis? And why isn't that part of your aversion to these companies calling them out? It, it bothers me that they can continue to make money in Boston. And yeah. one department knows how they didn't pay their workers. The other department is is just 
continuing. I, I, it was on, uh, let me be very clear. It was on a city project that um, we had um, our money, our project, they didn't pay their workers. And there seemed to be no communication and no acknowledgement. Um, they went through the Boston jobs residency policy. There, there was nothing. And I bring this up because there still seems to be nothing there. There seems to be no connection, no acknowledgement. No, this is this won't happen again, or we're going to be monitoring this. Yeah, no. When when and you're right, there isn't a direct link in terms of us monitoring the wage theft ordinance. But when we we did look into it just to see based based on your recommendation, you know, um, what the mechanisms are, and it seems like the city of Boston does have the what the ordinance establishes is that when if a company is disbarred or if they're found guilty of of uh, wage theft violations then the city's barred from contracting with that company and so i think that's the piece that i'm not sure the mechanism the communication sort of between like if it makes sense for it to be brjp or between um workforce development and you know the city's procure you know the city's buyers that are that are procuring but i i believe like that's the that's the leverage that we have that there has to be a finding and so we had asked about specific projects and or specific contractors but there hadn't been a finding so there wasn't anything that we could do from our vantage point but i think it's worth between both this and sort of the bad actors list i think we should figure out what the mechanism is once we have the information to like get it out to department buyers. And I know that DCAM is also very interested um, from in terms of BRJP noncompliance in seeing those lists as well. So I think we have to establish that mechanism um, and happy to, to be involved in that um, in, if it makes sense with wage theft as well. Okay, now I have a gavel and a raised eyebrow from Councillor Bach, so I will move on. Thank you very much, and I will follow up with you on those uh, those connections. Thank you so much to all of you um, for your hard work. I really do appreciate it, and know you are under a lot of pressure to get a lot done. And I do see the impacts, positive impacts in my district, so I want you to know it's m more good than anything. So thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Edwards. No, and those are important questions. Um, it's uh, yeah. I think I think it feels it feels clear that to me that there are certain like bad business practices the city could do more to mark and then say, hey, that's a black mark in our contracting, right? And I think the city has totally legitimate business reasons to say. I mean, obviously we've got the ordinance on wage theft, but uh, but even you know people who are not. Not don't have a proven track record of, of hiring Boston residents, and so I just think that like we have a um, we have a basis for saying, hey, that's an issue when we're considering our options in a bid. So, um, anyways, I, yeah, so definitely with second Councillor Edwards' concerns, um, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I'll go back um, to colleagues for any second rounds. Um, so I guess the first thing I just wanted to get on the on the reimagining main streets. We had the timeline in your presentation sort of taking us through April 2021, where it's sort of research, engagement, and SWOT analysis. I know you already did the community engagement piece. Um, I saw some of that happen uh, in my district, I think obviously somewhat constrained by the Zoom reality. Um, so I'm just trying to understand, I think Natalia, you threw out the sort of by the fall, but there's a lot of time between April and the fall. So what, what do you actually think the timeline on that looks like? Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, so we um, found some gaps in community engagement um, from January to May, as you can imagine with, uh, so there is an effort right now around actually doing some canvassing to be able to get more um, local businesses involved in that process, um, which is why community engagement will continue Sim simultaneously over the summer is, is the process of um, pulling together the research, um, the community engagement feedback, and anything else that might be required in order to make these um, recommendations to the city. 
uh, on behalf of the program. Um, we have a tentative October as the fall date, but um, again, you know, during this time, it will be a series of continued conversations and interviews um, that, you know, are part of that community engagement, as well as uh, creating that framework for the implementation of a new, um, you know, a new recommendation that might come from, from this process. So, I, you know, there are going to be tangible things that we can point to and say, come participate and be a part of this. But a lot of it is just um, kind of the back of the house work that needs to happen um, in order to, to really create and develop those, those um, recommendations. Great. No, I'm glad to hear you're doing the further engagement because I, I found that when I went to one that was sort of Fenway was one of the focused neighborhoods, we only had one Fenway business owner on. Um, and it's a little chicken and egg because Fenway is one of the places where I really felt in the pandemic, the absence of a main streets. Um, Cause I've got a bunch of independent businesses there and I've got also got a bunch of independent businesses in Mission Hill. And yet in Mission Hill, we had a main streets and there was real check-in and even just like little things like when the tea was threatening to require some of the restaurant patio barriers to be moved for a construction project. I got like immediate outreach from the Main Street's director. Can we fix this, et cetera? I feel like in Fenway, that kind of thing just goes unresolved, unnoted. And so it was concerning to me that like a report that I think is partly about how to get like, you know, how to loop in these other parts of the city. I didn't feel like we were seeing, um, like I didn't pop up and see all of my like small local business owners in Fenway who don't have a main streets, like getting to talk about what their life is like. So, um, so glad to hear that we're doing more engagement on that. And, and definitely would be, um, I think in my district, Fenway is the place where it feels like we could really use a main streets. And then I think also glad to hear you thinking about, you know, I've got various business associations in Back Bay and Beacon Hill. Um, and then also the downtown North um, one over in kind of the West End Canal Street area. Um, but I would say, you know, those ones, they're great and they and they do amazing work. I do think sometimes you feel the lack of connection to the city um, and it ends up being the counselor's office, right? Which is fine. But I think like, I think it's always, we, it's better when our offices are the ones who are catching when something that isn't happening the way it's supposed to, not when our offices are like the only way that people are, are kind of getting in touch with the city. So um, yes, yeah, so that's just my two cents on the main streets thing. Um, I was wondering, I think this is a question from Midori. If you could talk more about the job training for hard hit industries. Um, I mean, it's a million dollars. It's not very well defined yet. Um, I understand that we are building this bicycle while we ride it. Um, I guess the critique I've heard from some folks in hard hit industries is I don't want training. I want my job back, right? Like if I'm a hotel worker who had a great job, like I care a lot about the hotels going back to full capacity and hiring back their staff. It's not clear that retraining is what I'm looking for. And so I'm trying to understand, um, how we're thinking about that category and, 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 and that critique. Yeah, no, absolutely. So thank you. Um, so, you know, we are working uh, very closely with the Office of Workforce Development because uh, they are so the uh, content expert and they have kind of the ground level um, uh, kind of uh, knowledge on, you know, what's going on. And I think, you know, uh, Counselor, you, you know, as much as I do that with the pandemic, the future of work uh, became a little bit uh, unclear. Right. Uh, some of the sectors were hit hard and, you know, not sure some of the sectors will be come back at the level of pre-pandemic. Um, so, you know, we're working closely with our BPDA research team uh, to look at some of the data uh, to see where are some of the gaps uh, that we're seeing uh, using stuff like burning glass uh, to see the, all the vacancies uh, that are uh, coming uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Um, you know, we're also working this $1 million, you know, we got this uh, infusion uh, uh, through the Office of Economic Development, but our arts and culture, Office also got uh, some investment as well as our environment department. Uh, so all actually three of us with Office of Workforce Development are trying to figure out, okay, how is it? does it make sense for us to kind of add, right, all the fundings together and the kind of streamline a little bit, right? Uh, so that again, to your point, you know, I think the criticisms we hear is that sometimes there's so much going on, right? Uh, at the city level. So maybe, you know, there's a way for us to streamline uh, some of the training uh, uh, dollars 
uh, in the programming uh, and just really looking uh, more at how uh, we can a, either upskill, right, and retrain folks in that same industry, right, so that they can get their jobs back if their job kind of description changed as a result of the pandemic, right? We need to look into that. Or, you know, if they are looking to uh, go into a different industry, right, that's a kind of new uh, type of job skill training program. And those two um, track have a very different um, cost uh, as well as so programming and uh, infrastructure uh, to it. So at this point, you know, we don't have an answer yet. Uh, we are still in the kind of research and kind of the listening uh, mode uh, from our uh, work with some providers uh, and our economists and our research uh, department on how we should sort of invest uh, this dollar. And I, I do think, you know, I've heard, you know, with the unemployment insurance uh, providing significant amount of benefits, um, you know, it, it also has a hit hard on some of the companies right, that are trying to bring back their employees. Uh, and uh, some employees have not been able to come back because they're not just incentivized to come back, right, because of the unintended consequences we had, uh, because they were making more than they were uh, working on the job as well. So, um, you know, but we look forward to, um, you know, working uh, with our partners uh, to figure out uh, how we want to uh, invest this dollar. Yeah, I guess I just, I'll just say that uh, to me, so we've already had our hearing through the environment and with arts and culture. And I know that everybody's information on this. And again, I'm sympathetic to the fact that that's like, that's what we're doing, right? We got this ARP money in March, like we're doing the budget process now. We're all trying, and of course, like reopening is changing the timeline every day and we're all trying to figure it out. So I'm not, not trying to give you all a hard time about that. I feel like with environment, so I have spent a lot of time thinking about the conservation core stuff and, and Mariama has at the federal level. And I feel like even though there's a lot of details to figure out, I sort of feel like I know what jobs we're talking about and what kind of stuff we're doing there. And then on arts and culture, I got a pretty clear sense that, you know, a piece of this is seeing whether, um, you know, artists can add value to community engagement processes and stuff in ways that might create permanent roles, right? And also give them an opportunity to both permanent roles in the city and maybe make them marketable to private folks who need to do that kind of, um, it, like, you know, sort of more 3D engagement. Um, so I feel like I understand a little bit, even though all the details need to be sorted out of those two pots, and I don't really understand this one. So I guess that's why I like pushing on it a little bit because it it just feels like a grab bag. Yeah. So I think um, you know one of the things that you know we are certainly going to do is to uh, invest in some of the infrastructure for work with development providers, right? So uh, over the past year, they had to. Uh, transition from brick and mortar operation, right? Providing the training program in in person to going online completely, right? Uh, so that uh, put us a little bit of strain on the work with the bond provider. So we are gonna uh, see if we can use some of the funding to uh, allow people to build that infrastructure. It's it's simple, right? Just they just need more laptops. They need the you know Zoom account. They need more Wi-Fi and hotspots. And I think, you know, um, after that, you know, we are looking forward to having more specific uh, detailed uh, information on what specific industry we want to look at. And, you know, we're, I guess, you know, arts and culture environment is very targeted, right? Because it's that specific sector. Um, this hard hit industry, there's so many hard hit industries, right? $1 million is just not enough. Um, you know, the, the average cost for training program is $7,000 per head, right? Uh, so you do the math, it's, it just doesn't provide too much. So we're just, I think, uh, being a little bit more thoughtful and strategic before we say we're going to definitely invest in these sectors. Um, certainly, you know, you saw the all-inclusive campaign earlier, right? The tourism camp uh, within the tourism, right? But there's a small business, there's a restaurant, there's like so many different um, uh, sectors and industry embedded in there. So uh, we're certainly uh, looking at that as well. You know, we're also looking at reinvesting in maybe uh, the programs that already work, right? Um, that uh, that are uh, that are done by workforce development office. So, um, you know, we don't have a you know the very uh, specific answer for you right now. But once we have it, we're happy to share it with you. Yeah. No. I and uh, yeah. I just think that it would be. I think it's you know obviously like for the council, you want to know what you're authorizing money to do as much as possible prior to June thirtieth, right? And. Um, and I also think that, uh, you know, and also I do think that like, and, and this is, this will be my second round of questions because I'm, I am going to go back and quickly check for colleagues on second rounds, but like, 
one of the one of the things I want to focus in on with all of you is that I think you know we're all going to be talking about how to spend the kind of economic the the ARP funds that are focused on kind of you know economic impact the stuff that goes out directly right and you guys have had a form of that that Natalia walked through in a bunch of different funds um, and so I just think that we're going to be facing choices in the not too distant future of is your thing like have you figured out a thing that really scales to like five million dollars because to your point we're only like you know your millions only getting to 130 or something i don't know folks and um you know or is it like no actually we're much better off trying to prevent it's my own timer we're, we're we're much better off trying to like give these quick infusions to help certain businesses make the decision not to close right or like to or to hire back their people or whatever, then we are spending money on retraining. So the reason I'm pushing on it is because there's gonna be this like very imminent set of questions about where we're putting a marginal dollar of the economic impact money. Um, and so if a million isn't a lot, like we should scale something up, that's one thing. If it's like, okay, it's good to nibble around the edges, but actually feels like training isn't where the city is gonna make the biggest impact, we need to know that too. Um, so that's just kind of how I'm thinking about this. Um, before, I have some more questions, but I wanna go and check. I think Councillor Braden has second round questions and then Councillor Edwards, I'll come to you if, you, um, if you've got anything. Councillor Braden. Thank you. Um, and I really do appreciate all the incredible work that you folks are doing. Well, it's life changing for so many of our residents in, in Boston. Um, the, um, the pipeline, I. I I'm really struggling to um, understand the, 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 I think it takes a village to, to develop this pipeline, uh, interagency cooperation and cooperation with unions and, and nonprofits on the, uh, in the communities across the city. Um, is there, what is the, secret sauce to really ensure that we can develop a robust pipeline or, or what is getting in the way of us making that happen? Like I know our um, uh, Madison Parks High School has had some challenges, but I do understand they're on a, an upward trend and things are improving. So um, what obstacles are, are we looking at and how can we get those put put aside and also in terms of the you know we've increased the amount of linkage money uh, uh, and also a proportion of that will increase the amount of linkage money available for training um workforce development um uh, how are you folks um i know it's not quite your department but are you working with workforce development to strategize how to get the best uh, bang for our buck out of that extra extra money those are my two questions thank you yeah, so certainly, I'll oh, go ahead, Selena. No, um, I was just gonna start with the pipeline question. And I think um, there is, um, we do have an, um, a lot of data on which trades tend to have really low numbers. So I think that we, like, I don't think we have to start from the whole universe. There's trades that are consistently meeting these targets and trades that are not. And, and the way that, um, uh, union apprenticeship and training works. A lot of that is not even in the Boston area, depending on where the union is based. So I think that we can we can really start to look at specific trades and where we can partner with the unions and other training programs that are non-union um, to really find and support local Boston residents, women and people of color in those spaces. That's something that I think we can be very strategic about because we know where the gaps are and we can, we can try and work and find out are there, you know, could they do a Boston cohort or, you know, because some of these training programs are, you know, require a car to get to, you know, so I think that we can really, um, we can really be strategic about that. And I just think we haven't had the ability to one, you know, like do that level of analysis. Cause that is with all the staff we have on, on BRJP, we don't actually have a, a, a data analyst to help us like, but we do have, you know, many decades and we know of um, which trades we can really start prioritizing. Um, so that's something that we really wanna, wanna start working on. 
No, on the linkage question, uh, you're absolutely right. So it does, uh, it is managed by the Office of Workforce Development. Uh, and thanks to the recent increase, uh, you're absolutely right. We are going to see some increase in that. Um, I know, um, you know, one one of the things that uh, makes the linkage dollar uh, very distinct from other workforce development funding is it's a, it's a performance based contracting, right? So the these nonprofit workforce development providers are paid um, uh, once the the job placements have been completed and the retention have been made. Because uh, as you know, it's hard, it's easy to get people jobs. But retention is uh, the one of the hardest things uh, to to make sure that we support them throughout um, their career uh, to make sure that they stay uh, in in the job. Uh, so you know I, I don't have two specifics uh, on that, um, uh, but I'm happy to get you more answers on what additional investment they have been able to make uh, as a result of linkage uh, increase. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Great, thank you so much, Councillor Brady. Councillor Edwards, did you have second round questions? All right, seeing none, I'm going to jump back in. Um, so um, can I ask about, uh, oh, I just have a quick question about Be Local, the app, and, and Natalia, so two questions. One is, is any, like, map functionality ever going to come to it? Yes, it's coming. Okay. Literally any day now, we're waiting for the second version, uh, which will have a map. Um, um, and it will have a um, uh, search by industry as I well. Would, yeah, like a filter, like some more filtering. Exactly. Got it. It's, okay. it's been on, it's been on uh, my list for the, since the beginning of this program, and it just has taken longer for that part to get um, approval from the App Store. So okay. in, this, in the second version, it will be, um, which will, the update's coming in a uh, couple of days. And can you talk a little bit, and this is partly because we're on the record here, about um, about Plaid, the partner there? Because my office, we have received some concerns from people who are frankly not used to the idea of logging into their bank page through an app. Like they're used to putting maybe putting a credit card in and the, and the info, but that like, you know, signing in with their password and username to their bank feels like another step. And they're worried like, hey, has the city thought this through security wise? Like, what does this mean? So I just think it would be great if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure, absolutely. Um, so Plaid is a um, third party platform that actually um, has partnerships directly with banks to actually make it more secure for you to um, connect your credit card or debit card with um, with this this app. Um, one of the biggest concerns that we heard from the beginning was that people didn't want to directly um, include their credit card information uh, to anything that the city would have. Um, and Plaid was uh, a great solution um, on that. I do have um, we put together a little report based on some of those um, um, constituent questions that have come in, and I'm happy to share that with all of the counselors so that you all have those as speaking points. Um, but Plaid um, is a uh, trustworthy um, uh, third party you know, application that you use for Venmo, if anybody uses Venmo. Um, it's also uh, what Acorns uses um, and other you know, investment apps um, that are directly tied with your bank. Um, uh, it, it, it essentially means that they are collecting that information and the city is not, and neither is our partner Kolu. And so uh, people's personal banking information is um, through this third party. Got it. Sorry, that was Councillor Braden's timer. Um, uh, I see. Yeah, no, it would be great to get that info sheet for the whole council. I do think it might be worth, um, and I, re I say this recognizing that, you know, in the app store, this might come in ages from now, but like, it might be worth having some kind of like an info, like what is this or like, why my bank info, like something, cause I just think people still. Um, yeah, we've been trying to change some of the messaging and the language on that app. We don't, contr once you like go to upload your credit card, um, the plaid portion, we don't control, but on the actual app, we're trying to give more guidance um, and more language there to explain the relationship and actually explain that it's actually much safer uh, for you to log into your bank account than to have to type in your credit card number. Um, but it is, you know, and I think any digital 
solution right now is going to require a little bit of time for people to feel comfortable with some of those um, requirements. But yes, I would be del I would be happy to share that um, info sheet so you all can share it out with any constituent who needs more information. Great, thank you. Um, and then on the women's advancement side, um, the so you you were saying that you know for right now you got these cohorts of twenty. You're hoping to do five. You say right now when you have a cohort, you have like five times the application. So I guess what I'm curious about is like, we've done 20% of the industry. You think this year you can do another 20% of the industry. That might be kind of the demand, like that 100 might cover, because if you, if in a cohort of 20, you've got 100 people applying, like, you know, you might cover that. Or do you think there's, do you think like there's further tranches? Like, I guess I'm trying to understand, is this something where we expect that in three more years, we could get to literally all of the family child care providers, um, or is there a sort of drop off in engagement and connection to the city in a program like this? I mean, if you look at it, just when you think about reopening, and we, when we first thought about how this will affect us during COVID, um, to be completely honest, we were not expecting as, as much of applications as we received. So I can only foresee this number going up, right? And, and one of the things that I like to to highlight is that every time, a majority every time that we have a new um, application open, we have brand new providers who apply for the grants, which is something that speaks on behalf of the engagement and outreach that we do. Um, and to be um, completely transparent, it's something that it's definitely something that MOA is very proud of to make to see that um, our applications and our program are getting to new providers each time. Um, obviously, like I mentioned earlier, the numbers of uh, providers who stayed open during the pandemic are now opening, in which you have a lot that are actually looking into um, going back into the sector. One of the things that we focus a lot is when we do our informational sessions is that we always try to talk about the importance of what it is to starting a new um, startup. So um, we have these numbers right now. This is what we're expecting for FY22. Obviously, numbers can continue increasing as, um, as more providers do open um, child cares in the city. Boston. I think just to expand on what Alex just said that there, you know, we do already have folks from the first cohort who have applied again. And I think there, there would be room hypothetically in the future to offer like a 2.0 version of this workshop, because there is you know, only so much information you can get to in six workshops. Right. Um, so I think there, there's still like really room for creativity and expansion if we were to reach everybody. But um, we are of course hoping that there will be more startups as we go, right? If we can make it a more um, hospitable environment for family child care providers here in the city so that folks are staying open and new folks are wanting to open these businesses. I think um, there will be for a while plenty, plenty of um, folks who wanna engage with us. And what, I mean, I was, I was glad to see that you guys are partnering with UMass around an evaluation and that you've got the data about, um, you know, folks feeling enhanced confidence, um, which is obviously a really, you know, it's an important sort of qualitative factor. Um, are you guys tracking more enduringly, like, you know, what percentage of these folks who come and do the program with us stay open, grow their business? Like, you know, are, are we gonna long-term have a feel for how this has, um, you know, how, frankly, our intervention has affected the local industry, which is, of course, the purpose of this endeavor. I'll chime in really quick. And this is where our, our post and pre-survey comes in. Um, every time we have a new cohort, we have a from a pre-survey, which is basically that talks into um, what are the participants expecting, um, what are the things that we are looking for them to learn, and also what are they expecting from us and United Way to be able to teach them in the course. And then later on, we do a post-survey. Um, and this post-survey includes information as to how did the workshop help, how did the workshop structure your business, and um, to your point, counselor, as to at the same point, how has your workshop grown after um, you have taken um, the child care entrepreneur fun workshops. Right. No, I guess I'm just wondering, and I get that, I, I'm wondering whether we have any any capacity or anything set up to sort of track them longitudinally. Like, I would be curious to know in two years, in three years, like to your point about the churn in the industry, right? 
are we are we helping to create a foundation of more stable businesses? Like the proof is going to be in the pudding over the longer term there. So I'm just wondering if we how we're thinking about that. Yeah, we don't have that set up right now. Um, the first cohort that went through just finished in early um, like March of 2020. Um, so our hope is, of course, with a new staff person to manage this program that we'll be able to have a better connection with these cohorts as they move through time. Um, so I think it's certainly something that we can uh, talk about more, how, how to measure that impact. We do have... Um, the second evaluation that we have in process is being done by the Wellesley Center for Women um, because we have a subject matter expert there in uh, child care and women's employment. So we're hoping that um, that evaluation too will give us some more things to think about over time in terms of the program's impact. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I just think, I think it's, um, I think for the long run, also if you think about like, you know, this being a model that if we can prove it really moves the needle, other cities are going to want to copy and all of that. I just think that that longitudinal tracking is really important, not just the, the pre post. Um, cause also, you know, and it wouldn't necessarily be like, cause if, if what the longitudinal tracking showed us was it, it is possible. I mean, I, I'm not trying to be a downer, but like it is possible to have a great program that makes people feel great. And then to the point of counselor Campbell's question earlier, there are just insuperable barriers that swamp people's ability to last, regardless of the fact that you did provide them with good business supports. And for all of us trying to have different outcomes, like we want to know when that's the case, right? Versus when those the sort of the marginal stuff we can do on the city side is is like helping keep them in the game in a serious long term way. So, yeah, no, that's totally right. And I echo Ali's. I um, mean, to your point, it's um, it's one of the things that having on that extra support will allow the office to look at even more. And may I do say that when we do have applications come through, we have a good number of applications that do come from other cities. Um, and these are things that we always sit down and, and look at how much um, our program is going to other cities. That uh, we have applicants who apply every time, um, and unfortunately, we have to deny them due to the fact that they're not city of Boston residents and other businesses are, is not in the city, but um, just to see how much more attraction is also getting um, and gaining from other cities aside from Boston. Great, well, thank you so much. And then Natalia, the bids that we're looking at, where are we looking at this? The business improvement districts? Oh, uh, Midori can speak to that. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we've explored over the past few months on the Back Bay and the New Market. Uh, as well. Um, so those are two areas that we're looking at. Okay. And are you talking yet to, I mean, is that a conversation that you're having with Back Bay Association, yes. New Street Street League, et cetera? Mm -hmm. um, it would be good to loop me into that conversation. Absolutely. Um, uh, um, the Midori, I think you mentioned earlier in your conversation with, with BPDA, I think you mentioned the name of like a uh, some source for us of data on vacancies. Yeah, so we are making investment from this fiscal year's budget, so it's not actually for next fiscal year budget, uh, with the BPD research team um, to look at the, the business closures um, and the vacancy data, real live data. Because uh, as Natalia mentioned earlier, we just don't have that hard data available anywhere, right? The best case is a uh, census, uh, which is, you know, it's not live, <laughs> out updated, exactly. Um, so uh, so in order to do that, we need to purchase some data uh, from Google Analytics and some other uh, third party. Uh, so that's the investment we're making this year in partnership with the BPA research team. So we can look at that data uh, and then make some decisions. I have that information that, uh, you know, we're all looking to get. Okay, and is that a BPDA FY21 budget thing, or is that a city side? It's uh, our OED budget going into BPDA for them to purchase uh, the data. Got it. And did we, uh, did we, like, was that something we talked about last year, or is that something that's come up in the yeah, past? This, so, you know, when the pandemic started, right, we were all, you know, <laughs> uh, scrambling to just look at, find this data, and it, we found out that we just don't have this data, right? And we were trying to see, can we get creative? Like, you know, I know Councilor Buck, we talked about summer jobs last year. Can we get young people to then do like sense accounts of like all the businesses in the neighborhood and like who's closed, who's not closed. Um, and we just say, you know what, we just need to uh, just buy, invest in this uh, for the future. 
And so we'll, we're planning to have that data on an ongoing basis. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I think that's great. Do you know when you're gonna, when we're gonna have access to that? Yep, absolutely. We can share that with you. Okay, just cause I think um, the, you know, I think the next step from that, it's like having that data and then that helps you make a bunch of strategic right. decisions. I think right. that um, it helps us make strategic decisions about places that are hard hit. It also helps us think about, you know, obviously Councilor Mejia and I have been having a bunch of conversation on the council side about commercial vacancies and tracking. And one of the reasons there is to think about like, how could you set up programs that sort of proactively incentivize landlords to, you know, fill a long-term vacancy with a local business, maybe at a subsidized rent, especially in this climate, right? And like, we're helping to support it or something. Um, but, you know, with things like that, you always have to, you have to set them up so that you know that you're not just rewarding activity that was going to happen anyways. Yep. Um, and uh, and so the data piece is like really important, but that does feel like a kind of next frontier to me on commercial vacancies. Um, so yeah, it would be great. And we um, and we do have a, a filed ordinance um, that's sort of awaiting the end of budget season, but um, where we we're looking to kind of re more regularize commercial vacancy data collection on the city side. But frankly, if there are ways to sort of be like, oh, fait accompli, we can just buy that, you know, and not have it, not have it involve an onerous data collection process, like so much the better. The only thing that I would also add is that this data is also not going to be totally perfect. Um, again, you know, we, we, um, We'll continue to rely on those relationships on the ground, um, both through kind of my team and the main streets to report on some of those. Because again, like a a space might have no no um, uh, movement, right? No actions, no, nothing that we can measure as. So therefore, it may look like it's vacant, but um, there may still be leases or other legal contracts in place that would tell us that that space is not available. Um, so there, it, there are complexities there, but yes, we are really excited about this data piece. Great. Well, definitely, yeah, would love to be in the loop on that. Um, and then Natalia, can you speak a little bit, I swear I'm getting to the end of my questions, but would you um, speak a little bit about, on the grants program side, I saw that we had the sort of applicants compared with people who got it, recipients and applicants for the reopen fund. Um, I had wanted to also have that on the commercial rent relief fund. And I see we have where the recipients are, but not the applicants. Is that data that you guys have and can provide? Um, yes, it just uh, takes a really long time. This is all, uh, we don't have like, it, we yes, we can get that, um, and we will get that for you. It's just it we're, we do it manually, so um, it just takes a little bit of time because all of this data is collected through Google Forms and spreadsheets, and we have to pull that information manually. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> we're happy to we're happy to do it. Um, I wanted to directly respond to the the specifics around the reopen fund um, commercial rent relief. Um, happy to get that information to you. Yeah, that would be that would be great. And um, and can you speak a little bit more? I think I said this at a prior hearing, but I do feel like we haven't really we haven't had the level of conversation with you about these grant funds and sort of like what feels like what feels like the learnings about how we would do a next round that we've had with DND about the about the rental relief fund over there. And I just feel like again, we all know that we are about to be putting more money into some kind of small business relief funds. So like I would love to kind of hear a bit from you and 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 in particular thinking about, because look, the Small Business Relief Fund, April, May last year, we were all just like, just trying to get money out the door to people. Um, I guess the commercial rent relief in the winter feels like that was at a sort of, you know, we were deeper into the pandemic um, and, uh, and developing things with a little bit more time. Um, and so I just wondered if you could talk about what you've learned and what as we go, like, you know, what small business and OED for that matter, right, is recommending um, 
in terms of like uh, tweaks to our grant process and where to target and all of that? Yeah, um, great question. There's a lot of learnings. Um, one of the first being um, shifting from Google Forms into a, an easier uh, type of platform. So we're working with the with the Dua team on um, establishing um, NAC, which is the same platform that um, outdoor dining is using, which is really user friendly because users can actually see where their application status is. We spent a lot of time um, uh, you know, just monitoring emails to be able to respond to constituents who wanted to know where their status was. Um, so there is kind of that uh, forward facing as well as um, automatic dashboard that comes with that for both, um, you know, aggregate data for us, uh, but also just uh, a forward facing public facing um, form. So I think like that piece is something that we're um, looking to um, enhance and, and do for the next round or whatever that might look like. I think additionally, um, making sure that the process of getting a vendor ID um, is clear for people. Um, we tried to do this um, through, uh, you know, translation services, um, making sure people understand the reason why we have to have everybody go through a vendor ID process um, um, and just continuing to, to educate folks on that. Um, I think it, uh, it's also a high priority for us to, to continue to try to engage folks that haven't been engaged. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with a business owner about a grant, ask, you know, telling them that they you know, should apply, giving them all the information. And this is me, right? Um, so not even my team and others. Um, and then they, they still don't apply. Um, it's, it's one of those things that I just want to so having continued support from um all of this uh, all of the stakeholders on this call to help us spread the word about process and 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 that those applications are um open and available once they are open and available um other learnings uh, include, you know, just hearing back from from business owners about what they really need funding for. Um, and I think, you know, what we've seen over time is is um, un more unrestricted funding is is really important for business owners so that they can do what's best for their business. Um, but you know, making sure that we're setting the parameters. Um, in ways that allow us to monitor and you know adhere to compliance around that stuff, um, but just uh, being more flexible on how they can use those funds, I think, has been um, something we've heard uh, time and time again from business owners. You're muted. Thanks, um, and this is probably uh, for you and also for Midori. It just. Um, where do you like because I, I, there's this other piece of analysis right which is what are the places where the feds are covering needs better than we can right with direct things like there's obviously a substantial federal program that restaurants can apply to directly um and it and it offers a lot more money than we're going to be able to offer if we divide up all of our like money into that scale of grants and so um but then, you know, obviously there's spaces where the feds may, their programs may not be nimble enough, they may not be targeting. I mean, we always come back to sort of the undocumented community is one space where that's always sort of inherently true. But, um, but I just wonder how we're thinking as a city about scrutinizing what else is out there now at the federal and state level and where we most effectively fill the gaps. Yeah, um, so I think Part of that is, is, you know, we are using data to inform who we support based on Boston's data, which obviously the federal government is not doing. Um, just a quick note on the restaurant relief fund from the federal government, that's, I mean, it's been out for not even three weeks and it's almost out of funding already. Mm -hmm. um, so there will be continued needs um, that, will, that might overlap. Um, there's a lot of, um, conversations we've had with business owners over the last 18 months about just building trust um, with them um, that the federal government has not been able to do. Um, so even if the federal government may be um, issuing grants directly, there's still a, a lot of hesitation from 
business owners, especially those that you just mentioned, um, to go through the federal government for any type of relief. Um, we saw that PPEP when we were begging businesses to like go through the process, connecting them to our partners who were, you know, really doing a lot of that direct work and businesses just refused to do it. Um, so much so that I think, you know, they would, they were willing to close their business before going that route. So I think it will require a balance. We want to make sure that we're targeting the folks in Boston who need funding the most and in what ways they need funding the most. Um, but I think also just, you know, uh, continuing to bring um, the SBA and our partners at the state um, to our, you know, small business calls and, and having a point of reference for business owners who have questions, um, I think is helping to bridge some of those gaps and some of that lack of understanding. Yeah, no, that's great. And I, I guess, and sorry, Midori, did you want to get in on that? No, oh, go ahead. Please. I, I was just going to say, I think that, I think for us, I think that the the council obviously usually asks like a lot of retroactive questions about, you know, who did this money go to and how's it distributed across like industries and, and neighborhoods and stuff. And that's really good. And, and I appreciate all the data we have here. Although the one comment I'll have is I think the more than half the businesses in the certified business relief fund being classified other suggests to me there's some kind of data problem. Um, but aside from that, like I think you know it's great to see that mix. I think that as we go into the next phase, when I think about both this committee authorizing use of federal funds for economic support, and then also Councilor Flaherty's committee that you referenced earlier, I think that the council needs some more of that data you're talking about in terms of like what's driving our prioritization. Right, which is not about did we send it to a mix of industries and a mix of neighborhoods. It's about like, did we meet the need? Right, like where are we seeing it? And I feel like that's not, I mean, to some degree, shame on us. That's not the type of data request that we have sent you guys. But I do think it's going to be like pretty essential to evaluating where we're going in the next few months. Yeah, I think part of the need that we are trying to fulfill is the need of like who has actually done that. Um, who has actually applied and asked for something um, as like one way of measuring need. Um, I think that there's, um, I welcome obviously these conversations with you directly as well offline of around what are other ways that we can measure um, that need. Um, because, you know, I, I say this time and time again, every single business needs different things and every single business needs uh, different support systems and, and figuring out the best way to support the most businesses has been our um, intention over the last year and is our intention moving forward. Um, it's really hard to design programming that both is um, conscientious of, uh, of those needs while also anticipating other needs that might be coming up. Um, and so we are looking to do that. Um, and I would love to collaborate with you on that. Great. No, I'd love to talk more about that. Midori, I did want to let you get in on kind of where we're going next. And then we will wrap this up. I am mindful of that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, no, to Natalia's point, right, the need, um, you know, when we did the analysis, I think, um, you know, the total ask from the small businesses collectively were about 50, over $50 million, right, uh, in grant funding. And granted, like, not all of them will be eligible, right? Uh, there's some mix in there that won't be eligible. So, uh, but, you know, certainly, I think, you know, over the past year, you know, we were quickly suit up the operation of getting, getting the grants money out, like, a, as soon as possible, right? We're getting calls, emails from all the small businesses saying, like, we need we need this now. Um, so I think, you know, we have, we are able to apply some of the lesson learned in terms of like operationally, right? Like the transition from Google form to, you know, something more uh, substantial. Uh, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The next phase is kind of figuring, okay, then how do we then measure that impact, right? That we've made uh, in these businesses. And, you know, we have qualitative information, like anecdotes, right? That says that these are the kind of impact that we made. Um, but I think, you know, that uh, will certainly then help us prioritize kind of like in which sector, or which industry that we want to like really have a targeted uh, grant making process on that. And then just wanted to mention about the federal grant and other grant making process. So in the middle of the pandemic, when we survey, we did this like monthly survey of small businesses. Um, I, I remember, I don't remember what the response rate was like two, two or 300 um, small businesses that responded. Um, you know, when we asked, like, did you apply for CD grant? Uh, and then did you apply for federal SBA grants or, you know, PPP or whatever? 
um, the gap was pretty significant. I think 80% of people apply for state grants, but then I think only half, 50% uh, small business apply for the federal PPP grant. So I think, you know, I think Natalia, to, to Natalia's earlier point about, you know, there's still that, right, the feds and like the, the, the there's like that gap, uh, whether it's information or hesitation or, you know, like language, right? Um, you know, they, they think it's, it's simple, right? And uh, for us, maybe it is simple, but for some of the small business owners that are running day-to-day -day operation, uh, it might not be. So, and I do think, you know, with the pandemic, uh, we weren't able to kind of visit these small businesses like one-on-one -on -one in person, right? To just encourage them to apply. And um, I know some some of them did, uh, our staff did go uh, with their laptops and say, we're applying for this one, right? Oh, I'm gonna help you. Uh, so hopefully, you know, when we, as we reopen open the economy, we're able to kind of do more of that, uh, you know, canvassing grassroots uh, outreach. To help help businesses yeah no that's great and it is it is great to underscore that we are just closer to a lot of our businesses and, and more connected to them um and yeah and you guys have done tremendous work i think i i just find myself thinking in this moment a lot about like like you know the real outcomes we want are like you know we want we want folks to stay open instead of packing it in and we want folks to employ our people right so like, so these questions about like, where, like, where are the businesses that are most like, you know, what we do could help them in that moment of decision. Cause I also don't think people make like purely rational decisions. I think that people who feel supported decide to give it a go and people who don't decide to pack it in. And there's like a lot of emotion that's going on there. And so, you know, it's like, how do we make, how do we target our support in ways that are going to make those businesses that are on the edge Feel supported and specifically businesses that are going to, you know, ensure good jobs for our residents, right? That that feels like the game. Yeah, and I think part of that too is we don't want to create additional barriers to the success of these businesses. Sometimes they have one employee, and that one employee that they've had has been maybe there for. 10 years and that employee no longer lives in the city. And, you know, I think it's, it's a challenge when, you know, um, there's just, there's just a lot that, that we have to think about. And again, I, I just welcome, you know, your brain on that, um, Councillor Bach, because there are so many unintended consequences that come out of trying to do good sometimes that we want to make sure that we don't, uh, inevitably, you know, hit businesses harder. Um, but I, I do look forward to um, working with you on this. Great. No, look forward to working with you all. And yeah, I mean, yes, we're always worried about our intended consequences, but there's no question that, you know, both both these departments have had tremendous positive intended consequences on the, uh, on the you know, collective economic well-being of the city in the last year. So just I'll add my thanks um, to all the other counselors and uh, also, my thanks for sitting through the, the three hour hearing. I do appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm sure I'm sure we'll be continuing conversations both on and offline about all the grants and everything. Um, but for now, seeing as I have no public comment, um, this hearing uh, of the Boston City Council's Ways and Means Committee is adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.